A Chronicle of a Death Foretold Gabriel Garcia Marquez He was a Colombian writer and journalist who won the 1982 Nobel Prize in Literature. A Chronicle of a Death Foretold The day they were going to kill him, Santiago Nassar got up at 5.30 in the morning to wait for the ship in which the bishop was arriving. He had dreamed that he was going through a forest of fig trees where a tender drizzle was falling, and for a moment he was happy in the dream, but when he woke up he felt completely splashed with bird shit. I always dreamed of trees, her mother, Plachita Lanero, told me, 27 years later evoking the details of that ungrateful Monday. The week before I had dreamed that I was alone in a tinfoil airplane that flew without stumbling through the almond trees, he told me. She had a well-earned reputation as an accurate interpreter of other people's dreams, provided they were told to her while fasting, but she had not noticed any ill omen in those two dreams of her son, or in the other dreams with trees that he had told her in the mornings that preceded his death. Nor did Santiago Nassar recognize the omen. He had slept little and badly, without taking off his clothes, and woke up with a headache and a sediment of copper stirrup on his palate and he interpreted them as natural ravages of the wedding party that had lasted until after midnight. Moreover, the many people he met since he left his house at 6.05 until he was butchered like a pig an hour later, remembered him a little sleepy but in a good mood, and he casually told everyone that it was a day very beautiful. No one was sure if he was referring to the weather. Many agreed in the memory that it was a radiant morning with a sea breeze that came through the banana groves, as it was to think that it would be in a good February of that time. But most agreed that it was a funereal time, with a low, cloudy sky and a dense smell of sleeping waters, and that at the moment of misfortune a small drizzle was falling like the one Santiago Nassar had seen in the forest. Of the dream I was recovering from the wedding party on the apostolic lap of Maria Alejandrina Cervantes, and I hardly woke up to the uproar of the bells ringing because I thought they had been released in honor of the bishop. Santiago Nassar put on a white linen shirt and pants, both pieces without starch, the same as those he had put on the day before for the wedding. It was an occasion outfit. If it had not been for the arrival of the bishop, he would have put on the cocky dress and riding boots with which he went to El Divino Rostro on Mondays, the cattle ranch he inherited from his father, and which he administered with very good judgment although without much fortune. In the mountains he wore a 357 magnum on his belt, whose armored bullets, he said, could split a horse at the waist. In times of partridges he also carried his falconry implements. In the closet he also had a 30.06 Manla Cherskonar rifle, a 300 Holland magnum rifle, a 22 Hornet with a two-power telescopic sight, and a Winchester repeater. He always slept like his father slept, with the gun hidden inside the pillowcase, but before leaving the house that day he took out the projectiles and put it in the drawer of the nightstand. He never left her loaded, her mother told me. I knew it, and I also knew that he kept the weapons in one place and hid the ammunition in another very remote place, so that no one would give in to the temptation to carry them inside the house. It was a wise custom imposed by his father since one morning when a maid shook the pillow to remove the cover, and the pistol went off when it hit the floor, and the bullet destroyed the closet of the room, went through the wall of the living room, asterisk he passed with a roar of war through the dining room of the neighboring house and turned a life-size saint to plaster dust on the main altar of the church at the other end of the square. Santiago Nassar, who was very young at the time, never forgot the lesson of that mishap. The last image his mother had of him was that of his fleeting passage through the bedroom. He had woken her up when she was groping for an aspirin in the bathroom medicine cabinet, and she turned on the light and saw him appear at the door with the glass of water in his hand, as she was to remember him forever. Santiago Nassar then told her about the dream, but she did not pay attention to the trees. All dreams about birds are in good health, he said. She saw it from the same hammock and in the same position in which I found her prostrate by the last lights of old age, when I returned to this forgotten town trying to mend the broken mirror of memory with so many scattered splinters. She could barely make out the shapes in broad light, and she had medicinal leaves at her temples for the eternal headache her son left her the last time she passed the bedroom. She was on her side, 
clinging to the whistles on the head of the hammock to try to get up, and in the gloom there was the smell of baptistry that had surprised me the morning of the crime. I hardly appeared in vain. Of the door confused me with the memory of Santiago Nassar. There it was, he told me. The dress was made of white linen washed with only water, because it was of such delicate skin that it could not bear the noise of the starch. She sat in the hammock for a long time, chewing cardamine seeds, until the illusion that her son had returned passed away. Then he sighed, he was the man of my life. I saw it in his memory. He had turned twenty-one the last week of January, and he was slim and pale, with his father's Arab eyelids and curly hair. He was the only child of a marriage of convenience who did not have a single moment of happiness, but he seemed happy with his father until his father died suddenly, three years before, and continued to seem so with the lonely mother until the Monday of his death. From her he inherited the instinct. From his father he learned from a very young age the mastery of firearms, the love for horses and the skill of birds of tall prey, but from him he also learned the good arts of courage and prudence. They spoke Arabic among themselves, but not in front of Plachita Linero so that she would not feel left out. They were never seen armed in town, and the only time they brought their trained hawks was to make a show of arrogance at a charity bazaar. The death of his father had forced him to drop out at the end of high school, to take over the family ranch. By his own merits, Santiago Nassar was cheerful and peaceful, and easy-hearted. The day he was to be killed, his mother believed that he had mistaken the date when she saw him dressed in white. I reminded him it was Monday, he told me. But he explained that he had dressed as a pontifical in case he had a chance to kiss the bishop's ring. She didn't show any interest. He won't even get off the ship, he told her. He will cast an engagement blessing, as always, and he will go where he came from. He hates this town. Santiago Nassar knew it was true, but the splendor of the church caused him an irresistible fascination. It's like zinc, he had once told me. His mother, on the other hand, the only thing that interested her about the arrival of the bishop was that the sun did not get wet in the rain, because she had heard him sneeze while he slept. She advised him to bring an umbrella, but he waved goodbye and left the room. It was the last time she saw him. Victoria Guzman, the cook, was sure the tide had not rained that day, nor in the entire month of February. On the contrary, she told me when I came to see her, shortly before her death. The sun warmed earlier than in August. She was butchering three rabbits for lunch, surrounded by roaming dogs, when Santiago Nassar entered the kitchen. He always woke up looking bad at night, remembered Victoria Guzman without love. Divina Flor, his daughter, who was just beginning to bloom, served Santiago Nassar a bowl of Cerro coffee with a splash of cane alcohol, like every Monday, to help him bear the burden of the night before. The huge kitchen, with the whispering fire and the sleeping chickens on the perches, breathed stealthily. Santiago Nassar chewed another aspirin and sat down to sip his coffee mug slowly, thinking slowly without taking his eyes off the two women gutting the rabbits on the stove. Despite her age, Victoria Guzman kept herself whole. The girl, still a bit wild, seemed suffocated by the rush of her glands. Santiago Nassar grabbed her by the wrist as she went to receive him the empty bowl. Now you are in time to work out, he told her. Victoria Guzman showed him the bloody knife. Let go of her, white he ordered seriously. You will not drink that water while I am alive. She had been seduced by Ibrahim Nassar in the prime of adolescence. He had secretly loved her for several years in the ranch stables, and took her to serve in his home when his affection ran out. Divina Flor, who was the daughter of a more recent husband, knew herself destined for Santiago Nassar's furtive bed, and that idea caused her premature anxiety. No other man like that has been born again, she told me, fat and withered, and surrounded by the children of other loves. He was identical to his father, Victoria Guzman replied. Shit. But she couldn't avoid a quick burst of horror as she remembered Santiago Nassar's horror when she ripped out the entrails of a rabbit and threw the steaming gut at the dogs. Don't be a barbarian, 
he told her. Imagine it was a human being. It took Victoria Guzman almost 20 years to understand that a man accustomed to killing unarmed animals would suddenly express such horror. Good God, she exclaimed, frightened, so that was all a revelation. However, he had so many late rages on the morning of the crime that he continued to feed the dogs with the entrails of the other rabbits, just to make Santiago Nassar's breakfast bitter. In those they were when the entire town awoke to the shocking roar of the steamboat in which the bishop was arriving. The house was an old two-story warehouse, with rough plank walls and a gabled zinc roof, over which buzzards watched for the garbage from the harbor. It had been built in the days when the river was so serviceable that many sea barges, and even some tall ships, ventured here through the swamps of the estuary. When Ibrahim Nassar came with the last Arabs, at the end of the civil wars, the sea boats were no longer arriving due to the changes in the river, and the warehouse was in disuse. Ibrahim Nassar bought it at any price to set up an import store that he never set up, and only when he was getting married did he turn it into a house to live in. On the ground floor he opened a room that was used for everything, and in the background he built a stable for four animals, the utility rooms, and a farm kitchen with windows facing the port where the stench of the waters entered at all hours. The only thing he left intact in the living room was the spiral staircase rescued from a shipwreck. On the top floor, where the customs offices used to be, he built two spacious bedrooms and five cabins for the many children he planned to have, and built a wooden balcony over the almond trees in the square, where Plachitalanero would sit in the afternoons of March to console himself for his loneliness. On the façade, he kept the main door and made two full-length windows with turned bobbins. He also kept the rear door, only a little higher for writing, and he kept part of the old dock in service. That was always the door most used, not only because it was the natural access to the stables and the kitchen, but because it faced the street of the new port without going through the square. The front door, except on festive occasions, remained closed and locked. However, it was there, and not through the back door, where the men who were going to kill him were waiting for Santiago Nassar, and it was there that he went out to receive the bishop, despite the fact that he had to give him a complete turn to the house to get to the port. No one could understand so many dire coincidences. The investigating judge who came from Raya Hacha must have felt them without daring to admit them, since his interest in giving them a rational explanation was evident in the summary. The door of the square was mentioned several times with a serialized name, the fatal door. In reality, the only valid explanation seemed to be that of Plachita Lanero, who answered the question with her mother's reason, my son never went out the back door when he was well dressed. It seemed such an easy truth that the instructor recorded it on a marginal note, but did not write it down in the summary. Victoria Guzman, for her part, was categorical in her response that neither she nor her daughter knew that Santiago Nassar was waiting to be killed. But over the course of her years she admitted that they both knew it when he walked into the kitchen for coffee. He had been told this by a woman who stopped by after five to ask for some milk for charity and also revealed the reasons and the place where they were waiting for him. I did not prevent it because I thought they were drunk and talk, he told me. However, Divina Flor confessed to me on a later visit, when her mother had already died, that she had not said anything to Santiago Nassar because deep down in her soul she wanted to be killed. On the other hand, she did not prevent him because then she was nothing more than a frightened child, incapable of a decision of her own and she had been much more scared when he grabbed her by the wrist with a hand that felt frozen and stony, like a dead man's hand. Santiago Nassar strode through the darkened house, pursued by the jubilant roars of the bishop's ship. Divina Flor went ahead of him to open the door for him, trying not to get caught between the sleeping bird cages in the dining room, between the wicker furniture and the fern pots hanging in the living room, but when he unlocked the door, she did not he was able to avoid the butcher hawk's hand again. He grabbed my whole pussy, Divina Flor told me. It was what I always did when I was alone in the corners of the house, but that day I did not feel the usual fright but a horrible desire to cry. She stepped aside to let him out, and through the half-open door she saw the almond trees in the plaza, snowed in by the dawn glow, but she didn't have the courage to see anything else. 
Then the ship's whistle ended and the roosters started crowing, he told me. It was such a commotion that it was impossible to believe that there were so many roosters in the village, and I thought they were coming in the bishop's ship. The only thing she could do for the man who was never to be hers was to leave the door unlocked, against Plachitalanero's orders, so that he could enter again in an emergency. Someone who was never identified had shoved a paper inside an envelope, in which they told Santiago Nassar that they were waiting to kill him, and also revealed the place and motives, and other very precise details of the conspiracy. The message was on the ground when Santiago Nassar left his house, but he did not see it, nor did Divina Flor see it, nor did anyone see it until long after the crime was consummated. It had struck six and the public lights were still on. On the branches of the almond trees, and on some balconies, there were still the colored garlands of the wedding, and it might have been thought that they had just been hung in honor of the bishop. But the tiled plaza up to the church atrium, where the musician's stage was, looked like a dump of empty bottles and all sorts of rubbish from the public revelry. When Santiago Nassar left his house, several people were running towards the port, urged on by the bellows of the ship. The only open place in the plaza was a milk store on one side of the church, where the two men were waiting for Santiago Nassar to kill him. Clotilde Armenta, the owner of the business, was the first to see him in the glow of dawn, and she had the impression that he was dressed in aluminum. He already looked like a ghost, he told me. The men who were going to kill him had fallen asleep on their seats, clutching knives wrapped in newspapers in her laps and Clotilde Armenta caught her breath so as not to wake them up. They were twins, Pedro and Pablo Vicario. They were twenty-four years old, and they looked so alike that it was hard to tell them apart. They were thick in taste but of a good nature, said the summary. I, who had known them since elementary school, would have written the same. This morning they were still wearing their wedding dresses of dark cloth, too thick and formal for the Caribbean and they looked devastated by so many hours of bad life, but they had done the duty of shaving. Although they had not stopped drinking since the eve of the binge, they were no longer drunk after three days, but looked like sleepwalkers awake. They had fallen asleep with the first auras of dawn, after almost three hours of waiting in Clotilde Armenta's tent, and this was their first dream since Friday. They had barely awakened with the first roar of the ship but instinct completely woke them up when Santiago Nassar left his house. Then they both grabbed the roll of newspapers, and Pedro Vicario began to get up. For God's sake, Clotilde Armenta murmured. Leave it for later, even if it is out of respect for the bishop. It was a breath of the Holy Spirit, she often repeated. Indeed, it had been a providential occurrence, but of a momentary virtue. Hearing her, the Vicario twins reflected, and the one who had risen sat down again. They both followed Santiago Nassar with their eyes as he began to cross the plaza. They looked at him rather with pity, said Clotilde Armenta. The girls from the nun's school trotted across the square at that moment in their orphan uniforms. Plachita Lanero was right, the bishop did not get off the ship. There were many people in the port in addition to the authorities and the children from the schools and everywhere you could see well-fattened roosters that were brought to the bishop as a gift, because the crest soup was his favorite dish. There was so much wood in the loading dock that it would have taken the ship at least two hours to load it. But it didn't stop. He appeared at the turn of the river, grumbling like a dragon, and then the band of musicians began to play the bishop's hymn, and the roosters began to sing in the crates and stirred up the other roosters of the town. By this time, the legendary firewood-fueled wheelships were nearing completion, and the few that remained in service no longer had pianola or honeymoon cabins, and were barely able to sail against the current. But this one was new, and it had two smokestacks instead of one with the flag painted like an armband, and the plank wheel at the stern gave it the impetus of a sea ship. On the upper rail, next to the captain's cabin, was the bishop in a white cassock with his retinue of Spaniards. I was doing Christmas time, my sister Margot said. What happened, according to her, was that the ship's whistle released a jet of pressurized steam as it passed in front of the port, leaving those closest to the shore drenched. It was a fleeting illusion, 
the bishop began to make the sign of the cross in the air in front of the crowd on the dock, and then continued to do it from memory, without malice or inspiration, until the ship was lost from sight and only the commotion remained. Of the roosters Santiago Nassar had reason to feel disappointed. He had contributed several loads of firewood to Father Carmen Amador's public requests, and he had also chosen the most appetizing cocks himself. But it was a momentary setback. My sister Margot, who was with him on the dock, found him in a very good mood and in the mood to continue the party, even though the aspirin had not brought him any relief. He didn't look like a cold, and I was just thinking about what the wedding had cost, he told me. Cristo Bedoya, who was with them, revealed figures that increased astonishment. He had been partying with Santiago Nassar and me until a little before four o'clock, but he had not gone to sleep with his parents, but rather stayed talking at his grandparents' house. There he obtained a lot of data that he lacked to calculate the costs of the party. He said that forty turkeys and eleven pigs had been slaughtered for the guests, and four calves that the groom put to roast for the people in the public square. He said that 205 cases of contraband alcohol were consumed and almost 2,000 bottles of cane rum that were distributed among the crowd. There was not a single person, poor or rich, who had not participated in some way in the most scandalous party that the town had ever seen. Santiago Nassar dreamed aloud. This is what my marriage will be like, he said. They will not have enough life to tell it. My sister felt the angel pass by. He thought once more of the good luck of Flora Miguel, who had so many things in her life, and that she was also going to have Santiago Nassar at Christmas of that year. I suddenly realized that there couldn't be a better match than him, he told me. Imagine, beautiful, formal, and with a fortune of his own at twenty-one. She used to invite him to breakfast at our house when there were cassava caribanolas, and my mother was making them that morning. Santiago Nassar enthusiastically accepted. I'll change my clothes and catch up with you, he said, realizing that he had forgotten his watch on the nightstand. What time is it? It was 6.25. Santiago Nassar took Cristo Bedoya by the arm and led him to the plaza. I'll be at your house in a quarter of an hour, he told my sister. She insisted that they leave together immediately because breakfast was served. It was a strange insistence, Cristo Bedoya told me. So much so that sometimes I have thought that Margot already knew he was going to be killed and wanted to hide him in your house. However, Santiago Nassar convinced her to go ahead while he put on his riding clothes, since he had to be early at El Divino Rostro to castrate calves. He said goodbye to her with the same sign of the hand with which he had said goodbye to his mother, and walked away towards the square leading Cristo Bedoya by the arm. It was the last time she saw him. Many of those in the port knew that Santiago Nassar was going to be killed. Don Lazaro Aponte, academy colonel in good use and municipal mayor for eleven years, gave him a wave with his fingers. I had very real reasons for believing that I was no longer in any danger, he told me. Father Carmen Amador did not worry either. When I saw him safe and sound, I thought it was all an infusion, he told me. No one even wondered if Santiago Nassar was forewarned, because it seemed impossible to everyone that he was not. Actually, my sister Margot was one of the few people who still didn't know that he was going to be killed. If I had known, I would have taken it home even if it was tied up, he told the instructor. It was strange that I did not know, but it was much more so that my mother did not know it either because she found out about everything before anyone else in the house, despite the fact that she had not gone out to the streets for years, not even to go to Mass. I appreciated that virtue of hers since I started getting up early to go to school. I found her as she was in those days, livid and stealthy, sweeping the patio with a broom of branches in the ashen glow of dawn, and between each sip of coffee she was telling me what had happened in the world while we slept. He seemed to have threads of secret communication with the other townspeople, especially with those of his age, and sometimes he surprised us with advance news that he could not have known except through the arts of divination. That morning, however, he did not feel the throb of the tragedy that had been brewing since three in the morning. 
I had finished sweeping the patio, and when my sister Margot went out to meet the bishop she found her grinding the yucca for the carabanolas. You could hear roosters, my mother used to say, remembering that day. But he never linked the distant uproar with the arrival of the bishop, but rather with the last delays of the wedding. Our house was far from the big square, in a mango grove facing the river. My sister Margot had walked along the shore to the harbor, and the people were too excited about the bishop's visit to bother with other news. The sick had been laid down in the portals to receive God's medicine, and the women ran out of the courtyards with turkeys and piglets and all kinds of things to eat, and from the opposite bank came canoes adorned with flowers. But after the bishop passed without leaving his mark on earth, the other suppressed news reached its scandal size. That was when my sister Margot met her completely and in a brutal way, Angela Vicario, the beautiful girl who had married the day before, had been returned to her parents' house, because her husband found that she was not a virgin. I felt that I was the one who was going to die, said my sister. But no matter how much they turned the story upside down and backwards, no one could explain to me how it was that poor Santiago Nassar ended up involved in such a mess. The only thing they knew for sure was that Angela Vicario's brothers were waiting for him to kill him. My sister came home biting inside to keep from crying. He found my mother in the dining room, in a blue flower Sunday dress that she had put on in case the bishop came to greet us, and she was singing the Fadu of Invisible Love as she set the table. My sister noticed that there was one more position than usual. It's for Santiago Nassar, my mother told him. They told me you invited him to breakfast. Take it off, my sister said. Then he told her. But it was as if he already knew, he told me. It was the same as always, you start to tell her something, and before the story reaches the middle, she already knows how it ends. This bad news was a coded knot for my mother. Santiago Nassar had been given that name after her name, and she was also her baptismal godmother, but she also had a blood relationship with Pora Vicario, the mother of the returned bride. However, he had not finished hearing the news when he had already put on the high heels and the church mantilla that he only used then for visits of condolences. My father, who had heard everything from the bed, appeared in his pajamas in the dining room and asked him in alarm where he was going. To warn my comadre of Plachita, she answered. It is not fair that everyone knows that their son is going to be killed, and that she is the only one who does not know. We have as many ties to her as we do to the vicars, my father said. You have to always be on the side of the dead, she said. My younger brothers started to come out of the other rooms. The little ones, touched by the breath of tragedy, burst into tears. My mother ignored them, for once in her life, nor did she pay attention to her husband. Wait and get dressed, he told her. She was already on the street. My brother Jamie, who was no more than seven years old at the time, was the only one dressed for school. You accompany her, ordered my father. Jamie ran after her without knowing what was happening or where they were going, and grabbed her hand. I was talking to myself, Jamie told me. Men of bad law, he said in a very low voice shitty animals who are not capable of doing anything but misfortune. He did not even realize that he was holding the child by the hand. They must have thought I was crazy, she told me. The only thing I remember is that a noise of many people could be heard in the distance, as if the wedding party had started again, and that everyone was running in the direction of the square. He quickened his pace, determined that he was capable when a life was involved until someone running the other way took pity on his madness. Don't bother, Luisa Santiago, he yelled as he passed. They already killed him. Bayardo San Roman, the man who returned the wife, had come for the first time in August of the previous year, six months before the wedding. He arrived on the weekly ship with silver-trimmed saddlebags that matched the belt buckles and boot rings. He was in his early thirties, but very well hidden, as he had the narrow waist of a calf, golden eyes and skin simmered by saltpeter. He arrived with a short jacket and very narrow trousers, both made of natural calf, and kid gloves of the same color. Magdalena Oliver had come with him on the ship and could not take her eyes off him during the voyage. 
she looked like a queer, he told me. And it was a pity, because it was like to smear it with butter and eat it alive. She was not the only one who thought about it, nor was she the last to realize that Bayardo San Roman was not a man to know at first sight. My mother wrote to me at school at the end of August and said in a casual note, A very strange man has come. In the next letter he told me, The strange man is called Bayardo San Roman, and everyone says he is charming, but I have not seen him. No one ever knew what he came for. To someone who could not resist the temptation to ask, a little before the wedding, he replied, I was walking from town to town looking for someone to marry. It could have been true, but anything else would have answered the same, because he had a way of speaking that served him more to hide than to say. The night he arrived, he implied in the movies that he was a train engineer, and spoke of the urgency of building a railway to the interior to anticipate the vagaries of the river. The next day he had to send a telegram, and he himself transmitted it with the manipulator, and also showed the telegrapher his formula to continue using the dead batteries. With the same property he had spoken of border diseases with a military doctor who spent those months doing the cam. He liked long, noisy parties, but he was a good drinker, a fighter separator, and an enemy of sleight of hand. One Sunday after mass he challenged the most skilled swimmers, who were many, and left the best ones behind with twenty strokes back and forth across the river. My mother told me about it in a letter, and at the end she made a comment of her own, it seems that she is also swimming in gold. This responded to the premature legend that Bayardo San Roman was not only capable of doing everything, and doing it very well, but also had endless resources. My mother gave her the final blessing in an October letter. People love him very much, he told me, because he is honest and with a good heart, and last Sunday he took communion on his knees and helped the Mass in Latin. At that time it was not allowed to receive communion standing up and only officiated in Latin, but my mother usually makes those kinds of superfluous details when she wants to get to the bottom of things. However, after that consecrating verdict he wrote me two more letters in which he told me nothing about Bayardo San Roman, not even when it was too well known that he wanted to marry Angela Vicario. It was only long after the unhappy wedding that she confessed to me that she had met him when it was too late to correct the October letter, and that his golden eyes had caused her to shudder. He looked like the devil to me, he said, but you yourself told me that such things should not be said in writing. I met him shortly after she did, when I came to Christmas holidays, and I didn't find him as strange as they said. I found it attractive, indeed, but very far from the idyllic vision of Magdalena Oliver. He seemed to me more serious than his antics would lead us to believe, and of a hidden tension barely concealed by his excessive graces. But above all, he struck me as a very sad man. By then he had formalized his love affair with Angela Vicario. How they met was never very well established. The owner of the pension for single men where Bayardo San Roman lived, said that he was taking a nap in a rocking chair in the living room, at the end of September, when Angela Vicario and her mother crossed the square with two baskets of artificial flowers. Bayardo San Roman woke up halfway, saw the two women dressed in inclement black who seemed the only living beings in the morass of two in the afternoon, and asked who the young woman was. The owner replied that she was the youngest daughter of the woman who accompanied her, and that her name was Angela Vicario. Bayardo San Roman followed them with his eyes to the other end of the square. His name is right, he said. Then he leaned his head against the back of the rocking chair, and closed his eyes again. When I wake up, he said, remind me that I'm going to marry her. Angela Vicario told me that the owner of the pension had told her about this episode since before Bayardo San Roman required her in love. I was very scared, he told me. Three people who were at the pension confirmed that the episode had occurred, but four others did not believe it to be true. On the other hand, all versions agreed that Angela Vicario and Bayardo San Roman had seen each other for the first time in the national holidays in October, during a charity festival in which she was in charge of singing the raffles. Bayardo San Roman arrived at the festival and went straight to the counter attended by the languid rifer closed in mourning to the hilt, 
and asked him how much the mother of Pearl inlaid orthophone cost that was to be the main attraction of the fair. She replied that it was not for sale but for raffling. Better, he said, that way it'll be easier, and cheaper, too. She confessed to me that she had managed to impress her, but for reasons contrary to love. I hated haughty men, and I had never seen one with so many pretenses, he told me, recalling that day. Besides, I thought he was a Pole. His disappointment was greater when he sang the orthophonic raffle, amid everyone's anxiety, and indeed Bayardo San Roman won it. She couldn't imagine that he, just to impress her, had bought all the raffle numbers. That night, when she returned home, Angela Vicario found the orthophone there wrapped in gift wrap and adorned with an organza bow. I could never know how he knew it was my birthday, he told me. It was difficult for him to convince his parents that he had not given Bayardo San Roman any reason to send him such a gift, least of all in such a visible way that it did not go unnoticed by anyone. So his older brothers, Pedro and Pablo, took the speakerphone to the hotel to return it to its owner, and they did it with such a fuss that there was no one who saw it coming and did not see it return. The only thing the family did not have was the irresistible charms of Bayardo San Roman. The twins did not reappear until dawn the next day, cloudy with drunkenness, again wearing the orthophone and also taking Bayardo San Roman to continue the party at the house. Angela Vicario was the youngest daughter of a family with few resources. His father, Poncio Vicario, was a goldsmith for the poor, and his eyesight ran out from doing so much gold work to maintain the honor of the house. Purissima del Carmen, his mother, had been a school teacher until she was married forever. His meek and somewhat afflicted appearance well concealed the rigor of his character. She looked like a nun, recalls Mercedes. With such a spirit of sacrifice she devoted herself to caring for her husband and raising children that one sometimes forgot that she still existed. The two older daughters had married very late. In addition to the twins, they had an intermediate daughter who had died of twilight fever, and two years later they continued to mourn her relieved inside the house, but rigorous in the street. The brothers were raised to be men. They had been raised to marry. They knew how to hoop embroidery, machine sew, weave bobbin lace, wash and iron, make artificial flowers and fancy sweets, and write engagement notes. Unlike the girls of the time, who had neglected the cult of death, all four were masters of the ancient science of watching over the sick comforting the dying, and shrouding the dead. The only thing my mother reproached them for was the habit of combing their hair before going to sleep. Girls, he told them, don't comb your hair at night, sailors are late. Except for that, he thought there were no better educated daughters. They are perfect, I heard him say often. Any man will be happy with them, because they have been raised to suffer. However, it was difficult for those who married the two eldest to break the fence, because they always went everywhere together, organized dances for women alone and were predisposed to find ulterior motives in the designs of men. Angela Vicario was the most beautiful of the four, and my mother said that she was born like the great queens of history with the umbilical cord wrapped around her neck. But he had a helpless air and a poverty of spirit that promised him an uncertain future. I saw her again year after year during my Christmas holidays, and she seemed more and more helpless in the window of her house, where she would sit in the afternoon making rag flowers and singing waltzes as single women with her neighbors. He's already hanging on a wire, Santiago Nassar told me, your cousin the fool. Suddenly, shortly before the sisters' morning, I met her on the street for the first time, dressed as a woman and with curly hair, and I could hardly believe that she was the same. But it was a momentary vision, his penury of spirit worsened with the years. So much so that when it was learned that Bayardo San Roman wanted to marry her, many thought she was the perfidy of a stranger. The family not only took it seriously, but with great joy. Except for poor Vicario, who made it a condition that Bayardo San Roman prove his identity. Until then no one knew who he was. His past did not extend beyond the afternoon he disembarked in his artist garb, and he was so secretive about his origin that even the most insane spawn could be true. 
It was even said that he had raised towns and sowed terror in Kazanare as a troop commander, that he was a fugitive from Kn, that he had been seen in Pernambuco trying to thrive with a couple of trained bears, and that he had rescued the remains of a galleon Spanish loaded with gold in the Canal de los Vientos. Bayardo San Roman put an end to so many conjectures with a simple resource, he brought his family in full. There were four of them, the father, the mother, and two disturbing sisters. They arrived in a Ford T with official plates whose duck horn rioted the streets at 11 o'clock in the morning. The mother, Alberta Simons, a large mulatto from Curaçao who spoke Spanish still crossed with Papiamento, had been proclaimed in her youth as the most beautiful among the 200 most beautiful in the Antilles. The sisters, just in bloom, looked like two restless fillies. But the big card was the father, General Petronio San Roman, hero of the civil wars of the previous century, and one of the greatest glories of the conservative regime for having put Colonel Orleano Buendia to flight in the Tucurinca disaster. My mother was the only one who did not go to greet him when she found out who he was. It seemed very good that they were getting married, he said. But that was one thing, and quite another was shaking hands with a man who ordered Jerry Neldo Marquez to be shot in the back. From the moment he leaned out of the car window saluting with his white hat, everyone recognized him for the fame of his portraits. He wore a wheat-colored canvas suit, cordovan ankle boots with crossed laces, and gold glasses pinned to the cross of his nose and held up with a fob in the buttonhole of his waistcoat. He wore the Medal of Valor on his lapel and a cane with the national crest carved on the pommel. He was the first to get out of the car, completely covered by the burning dust of our bad roads, and he only had to appear in the box for everyone to realize that Bayardo San Roman was going to marry whomever he wanted. It was Angela Vicario who did not want to marry him. He seemed too much of a man for me, he told me. Furthermore, Bayardo San Roman had not even tried to seduce her, but rather enchanted the family with his charms. Angela Vicario never forgot the horror of the night when her parents and her older sisters with their husbands, gathered in the living room of the house, forced her to marry a man she had hardly seen. The twins stayed on the sidelines. It seemed to us that they were pods of women, Pablo Vicario told me. The decisive argument of the parents was that a family dignified by modesty had no right to despise that prize of fate. Angela Vicario hardly dared to hint at the inconvenience of the lack of love, but her mother demolished it with a single sentence, love is also learned. Unlike the courtships of the time, which were long and guarded, theirs lasted only four months due to the emergencies of Bayardo San Roman. It was not shorter because Pora Vicario demanded to wait for the family's mourning to end. But time reached without anguish due to the irresistible way in which Bayardo San Roman arranged things. One night he asked me which house I liked the most, Angela Vicario told me. And I answered him, without knowing what it was for that the prettiest in town was Shiuza's widower's villa. I would have said the same. It was on a hill swept by the wines, and from the terrace you could see the limitless paradise of swamps covered with purple anemones, and on clear summer days you could see the clear horizon of the Caribbean, and the ocean liners of tourists from Cartagena to Indias. Bayardo San Roman went that same night to the social club and sat at the table of Shiuza's widower to play a game of dominoes. Widow, he said. I buy you your house. It's not for sale, said the widower. I buy it with everything in it. Shiuza's widower explained to him with good old-fashioned manners that the objects in the house had been bought by the wife in a lifetime of sacrifice, and that for him they remained as part of her. He spoke with his soul in hand, said Dr. Dionisio Iguaran, who was playing with them. I was sure that he would rather die than sell a house where he had been happy for more than thirty years. Bayardo San Roman also understood his reasons. Okay, he said. Then sell me the empty house. But the widower defended himself until the end of the game. After three nights, better prepared, Bayardo San Roman, he returned to the domino table. Widower, he began again, how much does the house cost? Priceless. Say anyone. I'm sorry, Bayardo, said the widower but you young people don't understand the motives of the heart. Bayardo San Roman did not pause to think. 
Let's say 5,000 pesos, he said. Play fair, the widower replied with alert dignity. That house is not worth that much. 10,000, said Bayardo San Roman. Right now, and with one bill on top of the other. The widower looked at him with tears in his eyes. I was crying with rage, said Dr. Dionisio Iguaran, who in addition to being a doctor was a man of letters. Imagine, such a quantity at hand, and having to say no for a simple weakness of the spirit. Shiuza's widower's voice didn't come out, but he shook his head without hesitation. Then do me one last favor, said Bayardo San Roman. Wait for me here for five minutes. Five minutes later, in effect, he returned to the social club with the silver-plated saddlebags, and put on the table ten sheaves of thousand-dollar bills still with the printed bands of the state bank. Shiuza's widower died two years later. He died of that, said Dr. Dionisio Iguaran. He was healthier than us, but when you listened to him you could feel the tears bubbling in your heart. Well, not only had he sold the house with everything he had inside, but he asked Bayardo San Roman to pay him little by little because he did not have a chest of consolation left to save so much money. Nobody would have thought, nor did anyone say, that Angela Vicario was not a virgin. No previous boyfriend had been known to her and she had grown up with her sisters under the rigor of an iron mother. Even though she was less than two months away from getting married, Pora Vicario did not allow her to go alone with Bayardo San Roman to see the house where they were going to live but instead she and the blind father accompanied her to guard her honor. The only thing I begged God for is that he would give me the courage to kill myself, Angela Vicario told me. But he didn't give it to me. So stunned was she that she had resolved to tell her mother the truth to get rid of that martyrdom, when her only two confidants, who helped her make rag flowers by the window, dissuaded her of her good intentions. I obeyed them blindly, he told me because they had led me to believe that they were experts in men's shenanigans. They assured him that almost all women lost their virginity in childhood accidents. They insisted that even the most difficult husbands would resign themselves to anything as long as no one knew about it. Finally, they convinced her that most men arrived so scared on their wedding night that they were incapable of doing anything without the woman's help, and when push came to shove they could not answer for their own actions. All they believe is what they see on the sheet, they told him. So they taught her the tricks of midwives to fake her lost garments, and so that she could display on her first morning as a newlywed, open to the sun in her backyard, the linen sheet with the stain of honor. He married that illusion. Bayardo San Roman, for his part, had to marry with the illusion of buying happiness with the enormous weight of his power and fortune, because the more the party plans increased the more delusional ideas occurred to him to make it bigger. He tried to delay the wedding for a day when the bishop's visit was announced, so that he would marry them, but Angela Vicario objected. The truth, she told me, is that I didn't want to be blessed by a man who only cut the ridges for the soup and threw the rest of the rooster in the trash. However, even without the bishop's blessing, the party acquired a force of its own so difficult to master that Bayardo San Roman himself got out of hand and ended up being a public event. General Petronio San Roman and his family came this time on the National Congress ceremonial ship, which remained docked at the dock until the end of the festival, and with them came many illustrious people who, however, went unnoticed in the tumult of faces. New they brought so many gifts that the forgotten premises of the first power plant had to be restored to display the most admirable ones, and the rest were taken at once to the old house of Musa's widower, which was now ready to receive the newlyweds. The groom was given a convertible car with his name engraved in Gothic letters under the factory's shield. The bride was given a silverware case of pure gold for twenty-four guests. They also brought a show of dancers and two waltz orchestras that were out of tune with the local bands, and with the many papayeras and accordion groups that were excited by the noise of the party. The Vicario family lived in a modest house, with brick walls and a palm roof topped by two buardash where swallows would nest in January. In front it had a terrace almost completely occupied with flower pots, and a large patio with loose chickens and fruit trees. At the end of the courtyard, the twins had a pig farm, with its sacrificial stone and its butchering table, 
which was a good source of domestic resources since Poncio Vicario's site ran out. The business had been started by Pedro Vicario, but when he left for military service, his twin brother also learned the job of slaughtering. The interior of the house was barely enough to live. So the older sisters tried to borrow a house when they realized the size of the party. Imagine, Angela Vicario told me, they had thought about Placida Lanero's house, but fortunately my parents got screwed over the usual theme that our daughters are getting married in our pig pen, or not. So they painted the house its original yellow, straightened the doors and fixed the floors, and made it as dignified as possible for a noisy wedding. The twins took the pigs elsewhere and cleaned the pigsty with quicklime, but even so it was clear that there was going to be a lack of space. In the end, by diligences of Bayardo San. Roman, they knocked down the fences of the patio, they borrowed the adjoining houses to dance, and they put up carpenters' tables to sit and eat under the foliage of the tamarinds. The only unexpected startle was caused by the groom on the morning of the wedding, as he came to look for Angela Vicario two hours late, and she had refused to dress as a bride until she saw him at home. Imagine, he said, I would have been glad he didn't show up, but never that he left me dressed. Her wariness seemed natural, because there was no more embarrassing public mishap for a woman than standing there in her wedding dress. On the other hand, the fact that Angela Vicario dared to wear the veil and the orange blossoms without being a virgin, had to be interpreted later as a desecration of the symbols of purity. My mother was the only one who appreciated as an act of courage that he had played his marked cards to the last consequences. At that time, he explained, God understood those things. On the contrary, no one has yet known what cards Bayardo San Roman played with. From the time he finally appeared in a frock coat and top hat, until he ran away from the dance with the creature of his torments, he was the perfect image of the happy boyfriend. Nor was it ever known what cards Santiago Nassar played with. I was with him all the time, in church and at the party, along with Cristo Bedoya and my brother Luis Enrique and none of us saw the slightest change in his way of being. I have had to repeat this many times, as the four of us had grown up together in school and then in the same gang on vacation, and no one could believe that we had an unshared secret, let alone such a big secret. Santiago Nassar was a man of parties, and his greatest joy was on the eve of his death, calculating the costs of the wedding. In the church he estimated that they had placed floral decorations equal to the value of 14 first-class burials. That precision had to haunt me for many years, since Santiago Nassar had often told me that the smell of the enclosed flowers had an immediate relationship to death for him, and that day he repeated it to me when entering the temple. I don't want any flowers at my funeral, he told me, without thinking that I would have to see to it that there were none the next day. On the way from the church to the Vicario's house, he counted the colored garlands with which they adorned the streets, calculated the price of the music and the rockets, and even the hail of raw rice with which they received us at the party. In the midday slumber, the newlyweds made their rounds of the patio. Bayardo San Roman had become a close friend of ours, a friend of drinks, as they said at the time, and he seemed very comfortable at our table. Angela Vicario without the veil and crown and with her sweat-soaked satin dress, had suddenly assumed her married woman's face. Santiago Nassar calculated, and he told Bayardo San Roman, that the wedding was costing up to that moment about 9,000 pesos. It was evident that she understood it as impertinence. My mother had taught me that you should never talk about money in front of other people, she told me. Bayardo San Roman, on the other hand, received him in a very good mood and even with a certain boastfulness. Almost, he said, but we're just getting started. In the end it will be more or less double. Santiago Nassar set out to check it down to the last penny, and life caught up with him. Indeed, with the final data that Cristo Bedoya gave him the next day in port, 45 minutes before he died, he verified that Bayardo San Roman's forecast had been accurate. I had a very confused memory of the party before I had decided to rescue it in pieces from the memory of others. For years people continued to talk in my house that my father had once again played the violin of his youth in honor of the newlyweds, 
that my sister the nun danced a merengue with her Turner habit, and that Dr. Dionisio Iguaran, who he was my mother's first cousin, he managed to have him taken away on the official ship so that he wouldn't be here the next day when the bishop came. In the course of the investigations for this chronicle I recovered numerous marginal experiences, and among them the memory of grace of the sisters of Bayardo San Roman, whose velvet dresses with large butterfly wings, pinned with gold clips on the back, called more the attention to the plume of feathers and the breastplate of war medals of his father. Many knew that in the unconsciousness of the party I proposed to Mercedes Barca that she marry me, when she had barely finished elementary school, as she herself reminded me when we married fourteen years later. The most intense image that I always kept of that undesirable Sunday was that of old Pontius Vicario sitting alone on a stool in the center of the patio. They had put it there thinking perhaps that it was the place of honor, and the guests stumbled upon it, mistaken it for another, shifted it so that it would not get in the way, and he was shaking his snowy head all over the place with an erratic expression of too much blindness. Recent, answering questions that were not for him and answering fleeting greetings that no one made him, happy in his hedge of oblivion, with the cardboard gummed shirt and the guayacan cane that they had bought for the party. The formal act ended at six in the afternoon when the guests of honor said goodbye. The ship left with the lights on and leaving a trail of pianola waltzes, and for a moment we were adrift over an abyss of uncertainty, until we recognized each other again and sank into the mangrove swamp. The newlyweds appeared shortly after in the open-top car, scrambling their way through the tumult. Bayardo San Roman blew up rockets, took brandy from the bottles handed to him by the crowd, and got out of the car with Angela Vicario to get into the wheel of the Cumbiamba. Finally he ordered us to continue dancing on his own for as long as life would reach us, and he took the terrified wife to the house of her dreams where Shiuza's widower had been happy. The public revelry dispersed into fragments around midnight, and only Clotilde Armenta's business was open on one side of the plaza. Santiago Nassar and I, with my brother Luis Enrique and Cristo Bedoya, went to the house of mercy of Maria Alejandrina Cervantes. The Vicario brothers passed by, among many others, and they were drinking with us and singing with Santiago Nassar for five hours before killing him. There still had to be some scattered embers from the original party, because bursts of music came from everywhere. And remote lawsuits, and they continued to come to us, increasingly saddened, until just before the bishop's ship roared. Pora Vicario told my mother that she had gone to bed at eleven o'clock at night after the older daughters helped her put some order in the ravages of the wedding. Around ten o'clock, when there were still some drunks singing in the patio, Angela Vicario had sent for a briefcase of personal things that was in her bedroom closet, and she also wanted to send him a suitcase with everyday clothes, but the delivery boy he was in a hurry. He was sound asleep when there was a knock on the door. It was three very slow taps, he told my mother, but they had that weird thing about bad news. He told her that he had opened the door without turning on the light so as not to wake anyone, and he saw Bayardo San Roman in the glow of the public lantern, his silk shirt unbuttoned and his fancy trousers held up by elastic suspenders. He had that green color of dreams, Pora Vicario told my mother. Angela Vicario was in the shade so she only saw her when Bayardo San Roman grabbed her by the arm and put her in the light. She wore the satin suit in pile trefaz and was wrapped in a towel to the waist. Pora Vicario believed that they had run off the ravine with the car and were dead at the bottom of the precipice. Hail Mary Immaculate, she said, terrified. Answer if you are still from this world. Bayardo San Roman did not enter, but gently pushed his wife into the house, without saying a word. Then he kissed Pora Vicario on the cheek and spoke to him in a voice of very deep discouragement but with great tenderness. Thank you for everything, mother, he said. You are a saint. Only Pora Vicario knew what he did in the next two hours, and he went to his death with his secret. The only thing I remember is that he was holding me by the hair with one hand and hitting me with the other with such anger that I thought he was going to kill me, Angela Vicario told me but even that she did so quietly that her husband and her older daughters, asleep in the other rooms, did not find out anything until dawn when the disaster was already consummated. The twins returned to the house a little before three o'clock, urgently called by their mother. 
They found Angela Vicario lying face down on a sofa in the dining room, her face beaten, but she had finished crying. I wasn't scared anymore, she told me. On the contrary, I felt as if I had finally gotten rid of the sleep of death, and all I wanted was for everything to be over quickly so I could go to sleep. Pedro Vicario, the most determined of the brothers, lifted her by the waist and set her at the dining room table. Come on, child, he said, trembling with rage, tell us who it was. She barely took long to say the name. He looked for it in the darkness, found it at first sight among the many and many confusing names of this world and the other, and left it nailed to the wall with his accurate dart, like a butterfly without agency whose sentence has always been written. Santiago Nassar, he said. The lawyer supported the murder thesis in legitimate defense of honor, which was admitted by the court of conscience, and the twins declared at the end of the trial that they had done it a thousand times for the same reasons. They were the ones who saw the appeal of the defense since they surrendered before their church a few minutes after the crime. They stormed into the Casa Cural, closely pursued by a group of fiery Arabs, and laid knives with clean steel on Father Amador's table. Both were exhausted from the barbarous work of death, their clothes and arms soaked, their faces smeared with sweat and still living blood, but the priest remembered surrender as an act of great dignity. We killed him conscientiously, said Pedro Vicario, but we are innocent. Perhaps before God, Father Amador said. Before God and before men, said Pablo Vicario. It was a matter of honor. Furthermore, in the reconstruction of the events they feigned a fierceness much more inclement than reality, to the extent that it was necessary to repair with public funds the main door of Placida Lanero's house, which was chipped at knife point. In the Riahacha Panopticon, where they waited for trial for three years because they did not have to pay bail for parole, the older inmates remembered them for their good character and social spirit, but they never noticed any hint of repentance. However, the reality seemed to be that the Vicario brothers did not do anything that was convenient to kill Santiago Nassar immediately and without public spectacle, but they did much more than was imaginable so that someone would prevent them from killing him, and they did not kill him. They got. As they told me years later, they had started by looking for him at the house of Maria Alejandrina Cervantes, where they stayed with him until two o'clock. This data, like many others, was not recorded in the summary. In reality, Santiago Nassar was no longer there at the time the twins say they went to look for him, because we had gone out to do a round of serenades, but in any case it was not true that they had gone. They would never have left here again, Maria Alejandrina Cervantes told me, and knowing her so well, I never doubted it. Instead, they went to wait for him at Clotilde Armenta's house, where they knew half the world was going to pass except Santiago Nassar. It was the only open place, they declared to the instructor. Sooner or later I had to go out there, they told me, after they were acquitted. However, anyone knew that the main door of Placida Lanero's house remained locked from the inside, even during the day, and that Santiago Nassar always carried the keys to the rear entrance with him. That is where he entered his home, in effect, when the Vicario twins had been waiting for him on the other side for more than an hour and if later he left through the plaza door when he was going to receive the bishop, it was for one. Reason so unforeseen that the same instructor of the summary did not quite understand it. There was never a more announced death. After the sister revealed the name to them, the Vicario twins went through the storage room in the pigsty, where they kept the sacrificial tools, and chose the two best knives, one for butchering, ten inches long by two and a half wide, and another to clean seven inches long by one and a half wide. They wrapped them in a cloth, and went to sharpen them in the meat market, where they were just beginning to open some stores. The first customers were rare, but twenty-two people declared that they heard what they said, and all agreed in the impression that they had said it for the sole purpose of being heard. Faustino Santos, a butcher friend, saw them enter at 3.20 when he had just opened his table of entrails, and he did not understand why they were arriving on Monday and so early, and still in the dark cloth dresses of the wedding. He was used to seeing them on Fridays, but a little later, and in the leather aprons they wore for the slaughter. 
I thought they were so drunk, Faustino Santos told me, that they had not only got the wrong time but also the date. He reminded them that it was Monday. Who doesn't know, asshole, Pablo Vicario answered him in a good way. We only come to sharpen the knives. They sharpened them on the turning stone, and as they always did, Pedro holding the two knives and alternating them on the stone, and Pablo turning the crank. At the same time they talked about the splendor of the wedding with the other butchers. Some complained that they had not received their ration of cake, despite being fellow workers, and they promised they would have them sent later. At the end, they made the knives sing on the stone, and Pablo put his next to the lamp so that the steel would flash, we're going to kill Santiago Nassar, he said. Their reputations as good people were so well founded that no one paid any attention to them. We thought they were drunken pods, declared several butchers, as did Victoria Guzman and so many others who saw them later. I was to ask the butchers sometime if the slaughtering trade did not reveal a soul predisposed to kill a human being. They protested, when you sacrifice a beef you don't dare look into its eyes. One of them told me that he could not eat the meat of the animal that he slaughtered. Another told me that he would not be able to slaughter a cow that he had known before, especially if he had taken its milk. I reminded them that the Vicario brothers slaughtered the same pigs they raised, and they were so familiar that they could be distinguished by their names. It is true, one replied, but notice that they were not named after people but after flowers. Faustino Santos was the only one who perceived a real fire in the threat of Pablo Vicario and asked him jokingly why they had to kill Santiago Nassar when there were so many rich people who deserved to die first. Santiago Nassar knows why, Pedro Vicario replied. Faustino Santos told me that he was left with the doubt, and he communicated it to a police officer who stopped by shortly after to buy a pound of liver for the mayor's breakfast. The agent, according to the summary, was called Leandro Pornoi and he died the following year from a bull goring in the jugular during the patron saint festivities. So I was never able to speak to him, but Clotilde Armenta confirmed that he was the first person to be in her tent when the Vicario twins had already sat down to wait. Clotilde Armenta had just replaced her husband at the counter. It was the usual system. The store sold milk at dawn and groceries during the day, and was transformed into a canteen from six in the afternoon. Clotilde Armenta opened it at 3.30 in the morning. Her husband, the good Don Rogelio de la Flor, was in charge of the canteen until closing time. But that night there were so many customers lost from the wedding that she went to bed after three without having closed, and Clotilde Armenta was already up earlier than usual, because she wanted to finish before the bishop arrived. The Vicario brothers entered at 4.10. At that time only things to eat were sold, but Clotilde Armenta sold them a bottle of cane liquor, not only because of her appreciation for them, but also because she was very grateful for the portion of the wedding cake that they had sent her. They downed the entire bottle with two long gulps, but remained undaunted. They were stunned, Clotilde Armenta told me, and they could no longer build pressure even with lamp oil. Then they took off their cloth jackets hung them carefully on the backs of their chairs, and asked for another bottle. Their shirts were dirty with dry sweat and they had a beard from the day before that made them look montuno. They drank the second bottle more slowly, sitting down, looking insistently towards Placida Linero's house, across the street, whose windows were unlit. The largest on the balcony was the one in Santiago Nassar's bedroom. Pedro Vicario asked Clotilde Armenta if she had seen light in that window, and she said no, but it seemed strange to her. Did something happen to him? I ask. Nothing, Pedro Vicario replied. No more than we are looking for him to kill him. It was such a spontaneous response that she couldn't believe it was true. But he noticed that the twins were carrying two butcher knives wrapped in kitchen cloths. And is it possible to know why they want to kill him so early? I ask. He knows why, answered Pedro Vicario. Clotilde Armenta examined them seriously. He knew them so well that he could distinguish them, especially after Pedro Vicario returned from the barracks. They looked like two children, he told me. And that reflection scared her, 
because she had always thought that only children are capable of everything. So she finished preparing the milk dishes, and went to wake up her husband to tell him what was happening in the store. Don Rogelio de la Flor listened to her half asleep. Don't be an asshole, he said, they don't kill anyone, least of all a rich man. When Clotilde Armenta returned to the store, the twins were talking with Agent Leandro Pornoi, who was going to get the mayor's milk. He didn't hear what they said, but he guessed they had told him something about their intentions, from the way he watched the knives as they left. Colonel Lazaro Aponte had gotten up a little before four o'clock. He had just finished shaving when Agent Leandro Pornoi revealed to him the intentions of the Vicario brothers. He had settled so many friends' lawsuits the night before that he was in no rush for one more. He dressed calmly, made himself several times until the butterfly tie was perfect, and he hung the scapular of the Congregation of Mary around his neck to receive the bishop. While he was having breakfast with a liver stew covered in onion rings, his wife excitedly told him that Bayardo San Roman had returned Angela Vicario, but he did not take it with equal drama. My God! He scoffed, what is the bishop going to think? However, before finishing breakfast, he remembered what the orderly had just told him, put the two pieces of information together, and immediately discovered that they matched exactly like two pieces of a riddle. Then he went to the square through the street of the new port, whose houses were beginning to revive with the arrival of the bishop. I remember for sure that it was almost five o'clock and it was starting to rain, Colonel Lazaro Aponte told me. On the way, three people stopped him to secretly tell him that the Vicario brothers were waiting for Santiago Nassar to kill him, but only one could tell him where. He found them in Clotilde Armenta's shop. When I saw them I thought they were pure bravado, he told me with his personal logic, because they weren't as drunk as I thought. He did not even question them about their intentions, but instead took their knives from them and sent them to sleep. He treated them with the same self-satisfaction with which he had dodged his wife's alarm. Imagine, he said, what is the bishop going to say if he finds you in that state? They left. Clotilde Armenta suffered one more disappointment with the mayor's lightness, because he thought that he should arrest the twins until the truth was clarified. Colonel Aponte showed him the knives as a final argument. They no longer have anything to kill anyone with, he said. That's not why, said Clotilde Armenta. It is to rid these poor boys of the horrible compromise that has befallen them. Well, she had intuited it. He was certain that the Vicario brothers were not so eager to carry out the sentence as to find someone who would do them a favor to stop them. But Colonel Aponte was at peace with his soul. No one is arrested on suspicion, he said. Now it is a question of warning Santiago Nassar, and Happy New Year. Clotilde Armenta would always remember that Colonel Aponte's plump disposition caused her a certain unhappiness, and instead I would conjure him up as a happy man, although a little upset by the solitary practice of spiritualism learned by mail. His behavior that Monday was the final proof of his frivolity. The truth is that he did not remember Santiago Nassar again until he saw him in the port, and then he congratulated himself on having made the right decision. The Vicario brothers had told more than twelve people who went to buy milk about their resolutions, and they had spread them everywhere before six o'clock. To Clotilde Ernenta it seemed impossible that it was not known in the house opposite. He thought that Santiago Nassar was not there, because he had not seen the light in the bedroom come on, and everyone who could ask him to warn him wherever they saw him. He even told Father Amador, with the novice on duty, who went to buy milk for the nuns. After four o'clock, when he saw lights in the kitchen of Placida Linero's house, he sent the last urgent message to Victoria Guzman with the beggar who went every day to ask for some milk out of charity. When the bishop's ship roared, almost everyone was awake to receive it, and there were very few of us who did not know that the Vicario twins were waiting for Santiago Nassar to kill him, and the reason was also known with its full details. Clotilde Armenta had not finished selling the milk when the Vicario brothers returned with two other knives wrapped in newspapers. One was to be dismembered, with a hard, rusty blade twelve inches long by three inches wide, which had been made by Pedro Vicario with the metal of a hacksaw, at a time when German knives were not available because of the war. 
The other was shorter, but wide, and curved. The examining magistrate drew it in the summary, perhaps because he could not describe it, and hardly risked indicating that it looked like a miniature cutlass. It was with these knives that the crime was committed, and both were crude and widely used. Faustino Santos could not understand what had happened. They came to sharpen the knives again, he told me, and they shouted again to be heard that they were going to take out Santiago Nassar's guts, so I thought they were sucking a cock, especially because I didn't notice the knives, and I thought they were the same. This time, however, Clotilde Armenta noticed from the moment she saw them enter that they did not carry the same determination as before. Actually, they had the first discrepancy. Not only were they much more different on the inside than they appeared on the outside, but in difficult emergencies they had opposite characters. His friends had noticed him since elementary school. Pablo Vicario was six minutes older than his brother, and was more imaginative and determined until adolescence. Pedro Vicario always seemed more sentimental to me, and for the same reason more authoritarian. They reported for military service together at age 20, and Pablo Vicario was exempted from staying at the head of the family. Pedro Vicario served 11 months on public order patrols. The regime of troops, aggravated by the fear of death, matured the vocation to command and the habit of deciding for his brother. He returned with a sergeant's gonorrhea that resisted the most brutal methods of military medicine, and the arsenic injections and permanganate purges of Dr. Dionisio Iguaran. Only in prison did they manage to heal him. His friends agreed that Pablo Vicario suddenly developed a rare dependence on a younger brother when Pedro Vicario returned with a barracks soul and with the novelty of lifting his shirt to show whoever wanted to see it a scar from a line bullet on his left side. He even felt a kind of fervor at the gonorrhea of a large man that his brother displayed as a decoration of war. Pedro Vicario, according to his own statement, was the one who made the decision to kill Santiago Nassar, and at first his brother did nothing but follow him. But it was also he who seemed to consider the commitment fulfilled when the mayor disarmed them, and then it was Pablo Vicario who assumed command. Neither man mentioned this disagreement in their separate statements to the instructor. But Pablo Vicario confirmed to me several times that it was not easy for him to convince the brother of the final resolution. Perhaps it was not really but a burst of panic, but the fact is that Pablo Vicario entered the sty alone to look for the other two knives while the brother was dying drop by drop trying to urinate under the tamarinds. My brother never knew what that is, Pedro Vicario told me in our only interview. It was like urinating on ground glass. Pablo Vicario found him still hugging the tree when he returned with the knives. He was sweating cold from the pain, he told me, and he tried to tell me to leave alone because he was in no condition to kill anyone. He sat down at one of the carpenter's tables that had been set up under the trees for their wedding lunch, and pulled his pants down to his knees. He spent about half an hour changing the gauze that was wrapped around his cock, Pablo Vicario told me. In reality it did not take more than ten minutes, but it was something so difficult, and so enigmatic for Pablo Vicario, that he interpreted it as a new trick by the brother to waste time until dawn. So she put the knife in her hand and almost forcibly took it away to seek her sister's lost honor. This can't be helped, he said. It's as if it had already happened to us. They came out the pigsty gate with unwrapped knives, pursued by the rampage of the dogs in the yards. It was beginning to clear. It wasn't raining, Pablo Vicario recalled. On the contrary, Pedro recalled, there was a sea wind and you could still count the stars on your finger. The news was then so well distributed that Hortensia Bout opened the door just as they passed her house, and she was the first to cry for Santiago Nassar. I thought they had already killed him, he said, because I saw the knives in the light from the pole and it seemed to me that they were dripping blood. One of the few houses that were open on that lost street was that of Prudencia Coates, Pablo Vicario's girlfriend. Whenever the twins passed by at that time, and especially on Fridays when they went to the market, they would go in for their first coffee. They pushed open the patio door, harassed by the dogs that recognized them in the gloom of dawn, and greeted Prudencia Coates's mother in the kitchen. The coffee was not there yet. We'll leave it for later, said Pablo Vicario, 
now we're going to hurry. I imagine it, children, she said, honor does not wait. But they waited anyway, and then it was Pedro Vicario who thought the brother was wasting his time on purpose. While they were having coffee, Prudencia Coates came out to the kitchen in her teens with a roll of old newspapers to light up the stove. I knew what they were up to, he told me, and not only did he agree, but I would never have married him if he did not comply as a man. Before leaving the kitchen, Pablo Vicario took two sections of newspapers from him and gave one to his brother to wrap the knives. Prudencia Coates waited in the kitchen until she saw them come out through the patio door and she continued to wait for three years without a moment of discouragement, until Pablo Vicario was released from prison and was her husband of all life. Take good care of yourself, he told them. So Clotilde Armenta was right when it seemed to her that the twins weren't quite as determined as before, and she poured them a bottle of Vaporino Mullen in the hope of finishing them off. That day I realized, she told me, how alone we women are in the world. Pedro Vicario asked to borrow her husband's shaving utensils, and she brought him the brush, the soap, the hanging mirror, and the machine with the new blade, but he shaved with the chopping knife. Clotilde Armenta thought that this was the height of machismo. He looked like a movie bully, he told me. However, he explained to me later, and it was true, that in the barracks he had learned to shave with a barber razor, and could never do it otherwise. His brother, for his part, shaved in the humblest way with the machine borrowed from Don Rogelio de la Flor. Finally they drank the bottle in silence, very slowly, contemplating with the dim air of dawn the unlit window in the house across the street, while fake customers passed by buying milk unnecessarily and asking for things to eat that did not exist, with the intention to see if it was true that they were waiting for Santiago Nassar to kill him. The Vicario brothers would not see that window light up. Santiago Nassar entered his house at 4.20, but did not have to turn on any lights to get to the bedroom because the light on the staircase remained on during the night. He threw himself on the bed in the dark and with his clothes on, since he only had one hour left to sleep, and that is how Victoria Guzman found him when she went upstairs to wake him up to receive the bishop. We had been together at Maria Alejandrina Cervantes's house until after three o'clock when she herself dispatched the musicians and turned off the lights in the dance hall so that her pleasure mulattoes would lie down alone to rest. They had been working without rest for three days and nights, first secretly attending to the guests of honor, and then unleashed at open doors with those of us who were left incomplete with the wedding party. Maria Alejandrina Cervantes, who we said only had to sleep once to die, was the most elegant and most tender woman I ever knew, and the most helpful in bed but also the most severe. He had been born and raised here, and here he lived, in an open door house with several rooms for rent and a huge dance floor with gourds of light bought from the Chinese bazaars of Paramaribo. It was she who swept away the virginity of my generation. He taught us much more than we should learn, but above all he taught us that no place in life is sadder than an empty shania. Santiago Nassar lost consciousness since he saw her for the first time. I foresaw it, falcon that dares with a warrior heron, dangers await. But he didn't hear me, stunned by the chimerical whistles of Maria Alejandrina Cervantes. She was his unhinged passion, his teacher of tears at the age of fifteen, until I brought him Nassar threw him out of bed and locked him up for more than a year in El Divino Rostro. Since then they have remained linked by serious affection, but without the disorder of love, and she had so much respect for him that she did not sleep with anyone again if he was present. On those last vacations, she would dismiss us early on the implausible pretext that she was tired, but she would leave the door unlocked and a light on in the corridor so that I would secretly re-enter. Santiago Nassar had an almost magical talent for disguises, and his favorite fun was to alter the identity of the mulatto women. She looted the wardrobes of some to disguise the others, so that they all ended up feeling different from themselves and the same as those who were not. On one occasion, one of them was repeated in another with such success that she suffered a crying spell. I felt like I had come out of the mirror, he said. But that night, Maria Alejandrina Cervantes did not allow Santiago Nassar to indulge himself for the last time in his transvestite tricks, 
and he did so with such frivolous pretexts that the bad taste of that memory changed his life. So we took the musicians to a round of serenades, and we continued the party on our own, while the Vicario twins waited for Santiago Nassar to kill him. It was he who came up with the idea, almost at four o'clock, that we go up to Shiuza's widower's hill to sing to the newlyweds. We not only sing to them through the windows, but we shoot rockets and set off firecrackers in the gardens, but we do not perceive a sign of life inside the villa. It did not occur to us that there was no one, especially since the new car was at the door, still with the top down and with the satin ribbons and clumps of paraffin orange blossoms that had been hung for them at the party. My brother Luis Enrique, who then played the guitar like a professional, improvised a song about matrimonial misunderstandings in honor of the newlyweds. Until then it had not rained. On the contrary, the moon was in the center of the sky, and the air was clear, and at the bottom of the precipice you could see the trail of light from the wisps in the cemetery. On the other side you could see the blue banana fields under the moon, the sad swamps and the phosphorescent line of the Caribbean on the horizon. Santiago Nassar pointed out an intermittent fire in the sea, and told us that it was the banshee of a slave ship that had sunk with a shipment of Senegalese slaves off the large mouth of Cartagena de Indias. It was not possible to think that he had any discomfort of conscience, although at that time he did not know that Angela Vicario's ephemeral married life had ended two hours before. Bayardo San Roman had taken her on foot to her parents' house so that the noise of the engine would not reveal her misfortune before her time, and she was alone again and with the lights off in the happy fifth of Shiuza's widower. When we went down the hill, my brother invited us to have breakfast with fried fish in the inns of the market, but Santiago Nassar objected because he wanted to sleep for an hour until the bishop arrived. He went with Cristo Bedoya along the river bank, skirting the poor dairy farms that were beginning to light up in the old port, and before turning the corner, he waved us goodbye. It was the last time we saw him. Cristo Bedoya, with whom he agreed to meet later at the port, said goodbye to him at the back entrance of his house. Dogs barked at him out of habit when they heard him come in, but he soothed them in the gloom with the tinkling of keys. Victoria Guzman was watching the coffee pot on the stove when he walked through the kitchen into the house. White, she called him, the coffee will be ready. Santiago Nassar told him that he would take it later and asked him to tell Divina Flor to wake him up at half past five, and to bring him a clean change of clothes just like the one he was wearing. An instant after he went to bed, Victoria Guzman received the message from Clotilde Armenta with the milk beggar. At 5.30, she carried out the order to wake him up, but she did not send Divina Flor, but went up herself to the bedroom with the linen dress since she did not miss any opportunity to preserve her daughter against the clutches of the boy R. Maria Alejandrina Cervantes had left the door of the house unlocked. I said goodbye to my brother, crossed the corridor where the mulatto cats slept huddled among the tulips, and pushed without knocking on the bedroom door. The lights were off, but as soon as I entered I smelled the warm woman and saw the sleepless leopard eyes in the dark, and then I didn't hear from myself again until the bells began to ring. On the way to our house, my brother went to buy cigarettes at Clotilde Armenta's store. He had drunk so much that his memories of that meeting were always very confusing, but he never forgot the deadly drink that Pedro Vicario offered him. It was pure candle, he told me. Pablo Vicario, who had begun to fall asleep, woke up with a start when he felt him enter, and showed him the knife. We are going to kill Santiago Nassar, he said. My brother didn't remember it. But even if I remembered it, I wouldn't have believed it, he has told me many times. Who the hell could have thought that the twins were going to kill anyone, least of all with a pork knife? Then they asked him where Santiago Nassar was, since they had seen the two of them together, and my brother did not remember his own answer either. But Clotilde Armenta and the Vicario brothers were so surprised to hear it that they established it in the summary with separate statements. According to them, my brother said, Santiago Nassar is dead. Then he gave an episcopal blessing, stumbled on the door railing and stumbled out. In the middle of the square he passed Father Amador. He was going to the port in his officiating clothes, 
followed by an acolyte who rang the bell and several assistants with the altar for the bishop's pitched mass. Seeing them go by, the Vicario brothers crossed themselves. Clotilde Armenta told me that they had lost their last hope when the parish priest passed her house. I thought I hadn't gotten my message, he said. However, Father Amador confessed to me many years later, retired from the world in the gloomy Casa de Salud de Calafel, that he had indeed received the message from Clotilde Armenta, and others more peremptory, while he was preparing to go to the port. The truth is, I didn't know what to do, he told me. The first thing I thought was that it was not a matter of mine but of the civil authority, but then I decided to say something in passing to Plachita Lanero. However, when he crossed the square, he had completely forgotten about it. You have to understand, he told me, that unfortunate day the bishop was arriving. At the moment of the crime he felt so desperate, and so unworthy of himself, that he could think of nothing more than to order the fire to be played. My brother Luis Enrique entered the house through the kitchen door, which my mother would leave unlocked so that my father would not feel us enter. He went to the bathroom before going to bed, but fell asleep sitting on the toilet, and when my brother Jamie got up to go to school, he found him lying face down on the tiles, and asleep singing. My sister the nun, who would not go to wait for the bishop because she had a forty-degree hangover, could not wake him up. It was striking five when I went to the bathroom, he told me. Later, when my sister Margot came in to bathe to go to the port, she barely managed to carry him to the bedroom. From the other side of the dream, he heard without awakening the first roars of the bishop's ship. Then he fell asleep soundly, exhausted by the revelry, until my sister the nun entered the bedroom trying to put on her habit on the run, and woke him up with her mad cry, they killed Santiago Nassar. The ravages of the knives were just the beginning of the inclement autopsy that Father Carmen Amador was forced to carry out in the absence of Dr. Dionisio Iguaran. It was as if we had killed him again after he died, the former priest told me in his retirement from Calafel. But it was an order from the mayor, and the orders of that barbarian, stupid as they were, had to be carried out. It wasn't entirely fair. In the confusion of that absurd Monday, Colonel Aponte had held an urgent telegraphic conversation with the governor of the province, and he authorized him to carry out the preliminary proceedings while they sent an investigating judge. The mayor had previously been a troop officer with no experience in justice matters, and he was too foolish to ask someone who knew where to start. The first thing that disturbed him was the autopsy. Cristo Bedoya, who was a medical student, obtained the dispensation due to his close friendship with Santiago Nassar. The mayor thought that the body could be kept refrigerated until Dr. Dionisio Iguaran returned, but he did not find a human-size refrigerator, and the only appropriate one on the market was out of order. The body had been exposed to public contemplation. In the center of the room, stretched out on a narrow iron cot while a rich man's coffin was being made for him. They had brought the fans from the bedrooms, and some from the neighboring houses, but there were so many people eager to see it. That the furniture had to be moved and the cages and fern pots taken down, and yet the heat was unbearable. In addition, the dogs agitated by the smell of death added to the anxiety. They had not stopped howling since I entered the house, when Santiago Nassar was still dying in the kitchen, and I found Divina Floor crying loudly and holding them at bay with a bar. Help me, he shouted at me, they want to eat your guts. We lock them in the mangers. Plachita Lanero later ordered that they be taken to a secluded place until after the burial. But around noon, no one knew how, they escaped from where they were and broke into the house crazily. Plachita Lanero, for once, lost her temper. These fucking dogs. Scream. Get killed. The order was carried out immediately, and the house fell silent again. Until then there was no fear whatsoever about the state of the body. His face had been left intact, with the same expression he had when he sang, and Cristo Bedoya had put the viscera back in their place and had wrapped him with a band of canvas. However, in the afternoon, syrup-colored waters began to flow from the wounds, attracting flies, 
and a purple spot appeared on his mouth and spread very slowly like the shadow of a cloud in the water to the root of the tree. Hair The face that was always indulgent took on an enemy expression, and her mother covered it with a handkerchief. Colonel Aponte understood then that it was no longer possible to wait, and he ordered Father Amador to perform an autopsy. It would have been worse to dig it up after a week, he said. The parish priest had studied medicine and surgery in Salamanca, but entered the seminary without graduating, and even the mayor knew that his autopsy had no legal value. However, he enforced the order. It was a massacre, carried out on the premises of the public school with the help of the apothecary who took the notes, and a first-year medical student who was here on vacation. They only had a few minor surgical instruments, and the rest were artisan irons. But regardless of the damage to the body, Father Amador's report seemed correct, and the instructor incorporated it into the summary as a useful piece. Seven of the numerous wounds were fatal. The liver was almost severed by two deep perforations in the anterior aspect. He had four incisions in his stomach, one of them so deep that it went completely through and destroyed his pancreas. He had six other minor perforations in the transverse colon and multiple wounds in the small intestine. The only one on his back, at the level of the third lumbar vertebra, had perforated his right kidney. The abdominal cavity was occupied by large icebergs of blood, and between the quagmire of gastric content appeared a gold medal of the Virgin del Carmen that Santiago Nassar had swallowed at the age of four. The thoracic cavity showed two perforations, one in the second right intercostal space that affected the lung, and another very close to the left armpit. He also had six minor wounds on his arms and hands, and two horizontal cuts, one on his right thigh and one on his abdominal muscles. There was a deep pang in the palm of his right hand. The report says, it seemed a stigma of the crucified. The encephalic mass weighed 60 grams more than that of a normal Englishman, and Father Amador recorded in the report that Santiago Nassar had superior intelligence and a bright future. However, in the final note he indicated a hypertrophy of the liver that he attributed to a poorly cured hepatitis. That is, he told me, that he had very few years to live anyway. Dr. Dionisio Iguaran, who had actually treated Santiago Nassar for hepatitis at the age of 12, recalled that autopsy with indignation. He had to be a priest to be so stupid, he told me. There was no way to ever make him understand that the people of the tropics have bigger livers than the Galicians. The report concluded that the cause of death was massive bleeding from any of the seven major injuries. A different body was returned to us. Half of the skull had been shattered by trepanation, and the handsome face that death had preserved had just lost its identity. In addition, the priest had ripped off the severed viscera, but in the end he did not know what to do with them and he gave them a blessing of rage and threw them in the garbage pail. The last curious people leaning out of the windows of the public school ran out of curiosity, the assistant vanished, and Colonel Lazaro Aponte, who had seen and caused so many repressive massacres, ended up being a vegetarian as well as a spiritualist. The empty shell, inlaid with rags and quicklime, and hand-stitched with rough twine and baling needles, was about to fall apart when we put it in the new quilted silk casket. I thought it would stay that way for a longer time, Father Amador told me. The opposite happened, we had to bury him in a hurry at dawn, because he was in such bad condition that he was no longer bearable inside the house. It was a cloudy Tuesday. I did not have the courage to sleep alone at the end of the oppressive day, and I pushed open the door of Maria Alejandrina Cervantes's house in case the lock had not been locked. The gourds of light were lit in the trees and in the dance patio there were several wood-burning stoves with huge steaming pots, where mulatto women were dyeing their party clothes in mourning. I found Maria Alejandrina Cervantes awake as always at dawn, and completely naked as always when there were no strangers in the house. She was sitting Turkish style on the queen's bed in front of a Babylonian platter of things to eat, ribs of veal, a boiled chicken, pork tenderloin, and a side of bananas and legumes that would have served five. Eating without measure was always her only way of crying, and he had never seen her do it with such grief. I lay down beside him, dressed, hardly speaking, and crying myself in my own way. 
he was thinking of the ferocity of the fate of Santiago Nassar, who had claimed twenty years of happiness not only with death, but also with the dismemberment of the body, and with its dispersal and extermination. I dreamed that a woman entered the room with a girl in her arms, and that she was snoring without taking breath and half-chewed corn kernels fell on her bodice. The woman told me, she chews at the top of the mouth, a little lax, a little tearing. Suddenly I felt anxious fingers loosening the buttons of my shirt, and I felt the dangerous smell of the love beast lying behind me, and I felt myself sinking into the delights of the quicksand of its tenderness. But he stopped abruptly, coughed from far away, and slipped out of my life. I can't, he said, you smell like him. Not only me. Everything continued to smell like Santiago Nassar that day. The Vicario brothers felt it in the dungeon where the mayor locked them up while he figured out what to do with them. No matter how much I scrubbed myself with soap and a scouring pad, I couldn't get rid of the smell, Pedro Vicario told me. They had not slept for three nights, but they could not rest, because as soon as they began to fall asleep they would commit the crime again. Almost old, trying to explain to me his state of that interminable day, Pablo Vicario told me without any effort, it was like being awake twice. That phrase made me think that the most unbearable thing for them in the dungeon must have been their lucidity. The room was ten feet on a side, a very high skylight with iron bars, a portable latrine, a water ewer with its basin and jug, and two masonry beds with mat mattresses. Colonel Aponte, under whose mandate it had been built, said that there was never a more humane hotel. My brother Luis Enrique agreed because one night they imprisoned him for a musician's brawl, and the mayor allowed one of the mulattoes to accompany him out of charity. Perhaps the Vicario brothers would have thought the same thing at eight in the morning, when they felt safe from the Arabs. At that moment they were comforted by the prestige of having complied with his law, and their only concern was the persistence of the smell. They asked for plenty of water, mountain soap, and a scouring pad, and they washed the blood from their arms and faces, and also washed their shirts, but they could not rest. Pedro Vicario also asked for his purges and diuretics, and a roll of sterile gauze to change the bandage, and was able to urinate twice during the morning. However, life became so difficult as the day progressed that the smell took second place. At two in the afternoon, when the drowsiness of the heat might have melted them, Pedro Vicario was so tired that he could not remain lying in bed, but the same fatigue prevented him from standing. The pain in his groin reached up to his neck, his urine closed, and he suffered the dreadful certainty that he would not sleep again for the rest of his life. I was awake for eleven months, he told me, and I knew him well enough to know it was true. He was unable to eat lunch. Pablo Vicario, for his part, ate a little of everything that was brought to him, and a quarter of an hour later he unleashed himself in a pestilential anger. At six in the afternoon, while an autopsy was being carried out on the body of Santiago Nassar, the mayor was called urgently because Pedro Vicario was convinced that his brother had been poisoned. I was going into the waters, Pablo Vicario told me, and we couldn't get rid of the idea that they were pods from the Turks. Until then, the portable latrine had overflowed twice, and the guardian of view had taken it another six times to the mayor's toilet. There Colonel Aponte found him, gunned down by the guard in the toilet without doors, and draining so fluently that it was not absurd to think of poison. But they ruled it out immediately, when it was established that he had only drunk the water and eaten the lunch that Pora Vicario sent them. However, the mayor was so impressed that he took the prisoners home with special custody, until the investigating judge came and transferred them to the Riahacha Panopticon. The twins' fear responded to the mood of the street. A retaliation from the Arabs was not ruled out, but no one, except the Vicario brothers, had thought about the poison. Rather, they were supposed to wait for the night to pour gasoline through the skylight and set the prisoners on fire inside the dungeon. But even that was too easy a guess. The Arabs constituted a community of peaceful immigrants who settled at the beginning of the century in the Caribbean towns, even in the most remote and poorest ones, and there they stayed selling colored rags and fair trinkets. They were united, industrious and Catholic. They married each other, imported their wheat, 
raised lambs in yards and cultivated oregano and aubergine, and their only stormy passion was card games. The older ones continued to speak the rural Arabic that they brought from their land, and they kept it intact in the family until the second generation, but those of the third, with the exception of Santiago Nassar, heard their parents in Arabic and answered them in Spanish. So it was not conceivable that they would suddenly alter their pastoral spirit to avenge a death whose culprits could all be. On the other hand, no one thought of a retaliation from the family of Plachita Linero, who were people of power and war until their fortune ran out, and who had sired more than two canteen thugs preserved by the salt of their name. Colonel Aponte, troubled by the rumors, visited the Arabs family by family, and for this time at least he drew a correct conclusion. He found them perplexed and saddened, with mourning insignia on their altars, and some of them were crying loudly as they sat on the ground, but none had any intention of revenge. The reactions of the mourning had arisen in the heat of the crime, and its own protagonists admitted that in no case would they have passed the blows. Furthermore, it was Sasim Abdallah, the centennial matriarch, who recommended the prodigious infusion of passion flower flowers and wormwood that cut down Pablo Vicario's cholera and at the same time unleashed the flowery spring of his twin. Pedro Vicario then fell into an insomniac slumber, and the recovered brother reconciled his first sleep without remorse. This is how Purissima Vicario found them at three in the morning on Tuesday, when the mayor took her to say goodbye to them. The whole family left, even the older daughters with their husbands, at the initiative of Colonel Aponte. They left without anyone noticing, under the protection of public exhaustion, while the only survivors awake from that irreparable day were burying Santiago Nassar. They left while tempers calmed, according to the mayor's decision, but they never returned. Pora Vicario wrapped a cloth around the face of the returned daughter so that no one would see the blows, and dressed her in fiery red so that they would not imagine that she was mourning the secret lover. Before leaving, he asked Father Amador to confess to the children in jail, but Pedro Vicario refused, and convinced the brother that they had nothing to repent of. They were left alone, and the day of the transfer to Riahacha they were restocked and convinced of their reason, that they did not want to be taken out at night, as they did with the family, but in full sun and with their own face. Pontius Vicario, the father, died shortly after. The moral pain took him away. Angela Vicario told me. When the twins were acquitted they stayed in Riahacha, just a day's drive from Manor, where the family lived. Prudencia Coates went there to marry Pablo Vicario, who learned the gold trade in his father's workshop and became a refined goldsmith. Pedro Vicario, without love or a job, rejoined the armed forces three years later, earned the insignia of first sergeant, and one splendid morning his patrol entered guerrilla territory singing whore songs, and they were never heard from again. For the vast majority there was only one victim, Bayardo San Roman. They supposed that the other protagonists of the tragedy had fulfilled with dignity, and even with a certain greatness, the part of favor that life had indicated for them. Santiago Nasa had atoned for the injury, the Vicario brothers had proven their status as men, and the mock sister was once again in possession of her honor. The only one who had lost everything was Bayardo San Roman. Poor Bayardo, as he was reminded for years. However, no one had remembered him until after the lunar eclipse, the following Saturday, when Musa's widower told the mayor that he had seen a phosphorescent bird fluttering over his old house, and thought it was his wife's anima who was claiming his own. The mayor slapped his forehead that had nothing to do with the widower's vision. Damn! Scream! I had forgotten that poor man. He went up the hill with a patrol car, and found the open car in front of the fifth, and saw a lonely light in the bedroom, but no one answered his calls. So they forced a side door and went through the rooms lit by the embers of the eclipse. Things looked like underwater, the mayor told me. Bayardo San Roman was unconscious in bed still as Pora Vicario had seen him in the early hours of Monday with the fancy trousers and the silk shirt, but without the shoes. There were empty bottles on the floor, and many more unopened by the bed, but not a trace of food. He was in the last degree of alcohol intoxication, Dr. Dionisio Iguaran, who had treated him urgently, told me. 
but he recovered in a few hours, and as soon as he regained his reason he threw them all out of the house in the best possible way. Fuck me, he said. Not my dad with his veteran balls. The mayor informed General Petronio San Roman of the episode, down to the last literal sentence, with an alarming telegram. General San Roman must have taken the son's will at face value, because he did not come looking for him, but sent his wife with their daughters, and two other older women who seemed to be his sisters. They came in a cargo ship, closed up to the neck in mourning for the misfortune of Bayardo San Roman, and with their hair loose with pain. Before stepping on solid ground they took off their shoes and crossed the streets to the hill, walking barefoot in the hot noon dust, pulling out locks by the roots and crying with cries so heart-rending they seemed jubilant. I saw them go by from Magdalena Oliver's balcony, and I remember thinking that a grief like that could only be feigned to hide other greater embarrassments. Colonel Lazaro Aponte accompanied them to the house on the hill, and then Dr. Dionisio Iguaran got on his emergency mule. When the sun was relieved, two men from the municipality lowered Bayardo San Roman in a hammock hanging from a pole, covered up to his head with a blanket and with the entourage of mourners. Magdalena Oliver believed he was dead. Collins de Du, he exclaimed, what a waste. He was again prostrate from alcohol, but it was hard to believe that they were carrying him alive, because his right arm was dragging him along the ground, and as soon as the mother put it inside the hammock it would unhook him again, so he stopped a trail on land from the ledge of the cliff to the ship's platform. That was the last thing we had of him, a memory of a victim. They left the fifth intact. My brothers and I would go up to explore it on binge nights when we returned from vacation, finding less and less valuables in the abandoned rooms. Once we rescued the briefcase that Angela Vicario had asked her mother for on her wedding night, but we did not give it any importance. What we found inside seemed to be the natural shaves for the hygiene and beauty of a woman, and I only knew their true usefulness when Angela Vicario told me many years later what were the midwife tricks that had been taught to deceive her husband. It was the only trace she left in what was her married home for five hours. Years later, when I returned to look for the last testimonies for this chronicle, there were not even the embers of the happiness of Yolanda de Chius. Things had gradually disappeared despite the stubborn vigilance of Colonel Lazaro Aponte, including the six full-length window display that Mompox's master singers had had to put together inside the house, since it couldn't fit through the doors. At first, the widower of Shoes was delighted to think that they were posthumous resources of the wife to take what was his. Colonel Lazaro Aponte made fun of him. But one night it occurred to her to officiate a mass of spiritism to clarify the mystery and the soul of Yolanda de Muse confirmed in her own handwriting that in fact it was she who was recovering for her house of death the trinkets of happiness. The fifth began to crumble. The wedding car fell apart at the door, and in the end there was nothing left but the rotten clump of bad weather. For many years nothing was heard from its owner again. There is a statement from him in the summary, but it is so brief and conventional that it seems patched up at the last minute to comply with an inescapable formula. The only time I tried to talk to him, 23 years later, he received me with a certain aggressiveness, and he refused to provide the smallest information that would allow to clarify a little his participation in the drama. In any case, not even his parents knew much more about him than we do, nor did they have the slightest idea of what he came to do in a lost town for no apparent purpose other than to marry a woman he had never seen before. Of Angela Vicario, on the other hand, I always had news of bursts that inspired me an idealized image. My sister the nun spent some time in the upper Guajira trying to convert the last idolaters, and used to stop to talk with her in the village burned by the salt of the Caribbean where her mother had tried to bury her alive. Greetings from your cousin, he always told me. My sister Margot, who also visited her in the early years, told me that they had bought a material house with a very large crosswind yard whose only problem was on nights with high tides, because the toilets would overflow and the fish would wake up. Bouncing in the bedrooms. All who saw her at that time agreed that she was absorbed and skilled at the embroidery machine, and that through her industry she had achieved oblivion. Much later, at an uncertain time when I was trying to understand something about myself by selling encyclopedias and medical books around the towns of La Guajira, 
I came by chance to that Indian mound. In the window of a house facing the sea, embroidering by machine in the hottest hour, there was a woman in mourning with wire goggles and yellow-gray hair, and over her head was hung a cage with a canary that did not stop singing. Seeing her like this, within the idyllic frame of the window, I did not want to believe that this woman was the one I believed, because I was reluctant to admit that life would end up looking so much like bad literature. But it was her, Angela Vicario 23 years after the drama. He treated me the same as always, like a remote cousin, and answered my questions with good judgment and a sense of humor. She was so mature and witty, it was hard to believe she was the same. What surprised me the most was the way she had come to understand her own life. After a few minutes, she no longer seemed so old as at first glance, but almost as young as in memory, and she had nothing in common with the one who had been forced to marry without love at twenty years old. His mother, from a misunderstood old age, received me like a difficult ghost. He refused to talk about the past, and I had to settle for this chronicle with a few single sentences from his conversations with my mother, and a few others rescued from my memories. He had done more than possible to make Angela Vicario die while she was alive, but the daughter herself failed her purposes, because she never made any mystery of her misfortune. On the contrary, everyone who wanted to hear it was told with its details, except for the one who had never been clarified, who was, and how and when, the real cause of his damage, because no one believed that it was actually Santiago Nassar. They belonged to two divergent worlds. No one ever saw them together, much less alone. Santiago Nassar was too haughty to notice her. Your stupid cousin, she used to say to me, when I had to mention her. In addition, as we said then, he was a Polaro hawk. He walked alone, just like his father, cutting off the buds of every maiden aimlessly beginning to appear in those mountains, but he was never known within the town other than the conventional relationship he had with Flora Miguel, and the stormy one that drove him crazy. For fourteen months with Maria Alejandrina Cervantes. The most common version, perhaps because it was the most perverse, was that Angela Vicario was protecting someone she truly loved, and had chosen the name Santiago Nassar because she never thought her brothers would dare against him. I myself tried to extract this truth from her when I visited her the second time with all my arguments in order, but she barely looked up from the embroidery to refute them. Don't think about it any more, cousin, he said. Was they? Everything else he told without reluctance, until the disaster of the wedding night. She said that her friends had trained her to get her husband drunk in bed until he lost consciousness, to appear more ashamed than he felt so that he would turn off the light, to do a drastic wash of alum water to fake virginity, and that she stained the sheet with chrome mercury so that she could display it the next day in her newlywed patio. Only two things did not take into account their coverts, Bayardo San Roman's exceptional resistance as a drinker, and the pure decency that Angela Vicario had hidden within the stolidity imposed by her mother. I didn't do anything they told me, he said, because the more I thought about it, the more I realized that all this was crap that you couldn't do to anyone, least of all to the poor man who had had bad luck. To marry me. So she allowed herself to be undressed without reservation in the lighted bedroom, safe from all the learned fears that had ruined her life. It was very easy she told me, because I was determined to die. The truth is that he spoke of his misfortune without any shame to hide the other misadventure, the real one, that burned his insides. No one would have even suspected, until she decided to tell me, that Bayardo San Roman was in her life forever since he took her back home. It was a coup de grace. Suddenly, when Mom started hitting me, I started to remember him, she said. The punches hurt less because he knew they were from him. She kept thinking of him with a certain wonder of herself as she lay sobbing on the dining room sofa. He wasn't crying because of the blows or anything that had happened, he told me, he was crying for him. He kept thinking about him while his mother put arnica compresses on his face, and even more when he heard the shouting in the street and the fire bells in the tower, and his mother came in to tell him that now he could sleep, because the worst had last. 
She had been thinking about him for a long time without any illusions when she had to accompany her mother to an eye exam at the Raya Hacha Hospital. They passed into the Hotel del Puerto, whose owner they knew, and Pora Vicario asked for a glass of water in the canteen. She was taking it, with her back to her daughter, when she saw her own thought reflected in the repeating mirrors in the room. Angela Vicario turned her head with her last breath, and saw him pass her without seeing her and saw him leave the hotel. Then she looked at her mother again, her heart shattered. Pora Vicario had finished drinking, wiped his lips with his sleeve and smiled at her from the counter with the new glasses. In that smile, for the first time since her birth, Angela Vicario saw her as she was, a poor woman, devoted to the cult of her defects. Shit, he told himself. She was so upset that she went all the way back singing loudly and lay on the bed crying for three days. He was born again. I went crazy for him, she told me, to hell with it. It was enough for her to close her eyes to see him, she could hear him breathing in the sea, she was awakened at midnight by the heat of his body in bed. At the end of that week, without having gotten a minute's rest, he wrote her the first letter. It was a conventional obituary, in which she told him that she had seen him leave the hotel, and that she would have liked him to have seen her. He waited in vain for an answer. After two months, tired of waiting, she sent him another letter in the same biased style as the previous one, the sole purpose of which seemed to be to reproach him for his lack of courtesy. Six months later, he had written six unanswered letters, but was satisfied with the fact that he was receiving them. Owner of her destiny for the first time, Angela Vicario then discovered that hate and love are reciprocal passions. The more letters he sent, the more the embers of his fever lit up, but the more he also heeded the happy resentment he felt against his mother. My guts turned just looking at it, he said, but I couldn't see it without remembering him. Her life as a returned married woman was still as simple as that of a single woman, always machine embroidering with her friends as she used to make rag tulips and paper birds but when her mother went to bed she stayed in the room writing letters without a future until the early hours of the morning. She became lucid, imperious, the teacher of her agency, and she became a virgin only to him, and she recognized no authority other than her own and no more servitude than that of her obsession. He wrote a weekly letter for half his life. Sometimes I couldn't think of what to say, she said with a laugh, but it was enough for me to know that he was receiving them. At first they were obituaries of engagement, later they were slips of a furtive lover, scented tickets of a fleeting bride, business memorials, love documents, and finally they were the unworthy letters of an abandoned wife who invented cruel diseases to force him to return. One night of good humor the inkwell spilled on the finished letter, and instead of tearing it he added a postscript, in proof of my love I send you my tears. At times, tired of crying, she made fun of her own madness. Six times they changed the mail clerk, and six times she got her complicity. The only thing that didn't occur to him was to quit. Yet he seemed insensitive to her delirium, it was like writing to no one. One windy morning, around the tenth year, she was awakened by the certainty that he was naked in her bed. Then he wrote him a feverish letter of twenty sheets in which he shamelessly released the bitter truths that he had rotten in his heart since his fatal night. He told her about the eternal marks he had left on her body, about the salt on his tongue, about the threshing of fire on his African cock. She handed it to the mail clerk, who went to embroider with her on Friday afternoons to take the letters, and was convinced that this terminal release would be the last of her agony. But there was no reply. From then on he was no longer aware of what he was writing, or to whom he was writing for sure, but he continued to write without quarter for seventeen years. One midday in August, while embroidering with her friends, she felt someone come to the door. He didn't have to look to know who it was. He was fat and his hair was starting to fall out, and he already needed glasses to see up close, he told me. But it was him, damn it, it was him. She was scared, because she knew he was seeing her as diminished as she was seeing him, and she didn't think he had as much love inside as she to bear it. His shirt was soaked with sweat, as he had seen it the first time at the fair, and he wore the same strap and saddlebags of ripped leather with silver trim. 
Bayardo San Roman stepped forward, without taking care of the other stunned embroiderers, and put the saddlebags in the sewing machine. Well, he said, here I am. He carried the suitcase of clothes to stay, and another suitcase just like it with almost 2,000 letters that she had written to him. They were arranged by their dates, in packages sewn with colored ribbons, and all unopened. For years we couldn't talk about anything else. Our daily behavior, hitherto dominated by so many linear habits, had suddenly begun to revolve around the same common anxiety. We were surprised by the roosters of dawn trying to order the many chained coincidences that had made the absurd possible, and it was evident that we did not do it out of a desire to clarify mysteries, but because none of us could go on living without knowing exactly where the place was. And the mission that fatality had assigned him. Many were left unaware. Cristo Bedoya, who became a notable surgeon, could never explain why he gave in to the impulse to wait two hours at his grandparents until the bishop arrived, instead of going to rest at the home of his parents, who were waiting for him. Until dawn to alert you. But the majority of those who could do something to prevent the crime and yet did not, consoled themselves with the pretext that matters of honor are sacred watertight to which only the owners of the drama have access. Honor is love, I heard my mother say. Hortensia bout whose only participation was having seen two knives bloody that were not yet bloody, was so affected by the hallucination that she fell into a crisis of penance, and one day she could not bear it any more and threw herself naked into the streets. Flora Miguel, Santiago Nassar's girlfriend, ran away out of spite with a border lieutenant who prostituted her among the rubber tappers of Vichada. Ora Villaros, the midwife who had helped three generations to be born, suffered a bladder spasm when she heard the news, and until the day of her death she needed a catheter to urinate. Don Rogelio de la Flor, Clotilde Armenta's good husband, who was a prodigy of vitality at 86, got up for the last time to see Santiago Nassar being scrapped against the closed door of his own house, and he did not survive the shock. Plachita Linero had closed that door at the last moment, but she freed herself from guilt in time. I closed it because Divina Flor swore to me that she had seen my son come in, she told me, and it wasn't true. On the contrary, he never forgave himself for having confused the magnificent omen of the trees with the unfortunate one of the birds, and he succumbed to the pernicious habit of his time of chewing cardamine seeds. Twelve days after the crime, the investigator of the investigation found a people in the flesh. In the sordid plank office of the municipal palace, drinking pot coffee with cane rum against the mirages of the heat, he had to call in reinforcement troops to channel the crowd that rushed to declare without being called, eager to display their own importance in the drama. She had just graduated, and she was still wearing the black cloth dress of the law school, and the gold ring with the emblem of her class, and the pretense and lyricism of the happy first man. But I never knew his name. Everything we know about his character is learned from the summary, which many people helped me find twenty years after the crime in the Riahacha Palace of Justice. There was no classification in the archives, and more than a century of files were piled up on the floor of the decrepit colonial building that was Francis Drake's headquarters for two days. The ground floor was flooded with the Sea of Leva, and the unstitched volumes floated in the deserted offices. I myself explored that pool of lost causes many times with water up to my ankles, and only by chance, after five years of searching, I was able to rescue some 322 skipped sheets of the more than 500 that the summary must have had. The name of the judge did not appear in any of them, but it is evident that he was a man seized by the fever of literature. He had undoubtedly read the Spanish classics, and some Latin ones, and he knew Nietzsche very well, who was the author in fashion among the magistrates of his time. The marginal notes, and not only because of the color of the ink, seemed written in blood. He was so perplexed by the enigma that had fallen to him, that many times he incurred lyrical distractions contrary to the rigor of his science. Above all, it never seemed legitimate to him that life should make use of so many coincidences forbidden to literature, so that such a foretold death could be carried out smoothly. However, what had most alarmed him at the end of his excessive diligence was not having found a single indication, not even the least credible, 
that Santiago Nassar had actually been the cause of the injury. Angela Vicario's friends who had been her accomplices in the deception continued to tell for a long time that she had shared her secret with them since before the wedding, but she had not revealed any names to them. In the summary they declared, he told us the miracle but not the saint. Angela Vicario, for her part, remained in her place. When the investigating judge asked her with his lateral style if she knew who the late Santiago Nassar was, she replied impassively, he was my author. This is stated in the summary, but without any other precision of manner or place. During the trial, which lasted only three days, the representative of the civil party put his best efforts to the weakness of that position. Such was the perplexity of the investigating judge at the lack of evidence against Santiago Nassar, that his good work seems at times distorted by disappointment. On folio 416, in his own hand and with the apothecary's red ink, he wrote a marginal note, Give me a prejudice and I will move the world. Beneath that paraphrase of discouragement, with a happy stroke of the same blood ink, he drew a heart pierced by an arrow. For him, as for the closest friends of Santiago Nassar, his own behavior in the last hours was a final proof of his innocence. The morning of his death, in fact, Santiago Nassar had not had a moment of doubt, although he knew very well what the price of the injury that was imputed to him would have been. He knew the prudish nature of their world, and he must have known that the simple nature of the twins could not withstand scorn. Nobody knew Bayardo San Roman very well, but Santiago Nassar knew him enough to know that under his worldly pretenses he was as subordinate as anyone else to his original prejudices. So his conscious nonchalance would have been suicidal. Furthermore, when he finally knew at the last moment that the Vicario brothers were waiting to kill him, his reaction was not one of panic, as has been said so much, but rather the bewilderment of innocence. My personal impression is that he died without understanding his death. After he promised my sister Margot that he would come to our house for breakfast, Christo Bedoy led him by the arm along the dock, and they both seemed so unprepared that they raised false illusions. They were so happy, Mim Louisa told me, that I thanked God, because I thought the matter had been settled. Not everyone loved Santiago Nassar so much, of course. Polo Carrillo, the owner of the power plant, thought that his serenity was not innocence but cynicism. He thought his money made him untouchable, he told me. Fausta Lopez, his wife, commented, like all Turks. Indalicio Pardo had just passed by Clotilde Armenta's store, and the twins had told him that as soon as the bishop left they would kill Santiago Nassar. He thought, like so many others, that they were daybreak fantasies, but Clotilde Armenta made him see that it was true, and asked him to reach Santiago Nassar to prevent it. Don't bother, Pedro Vicario told him, anyway it's as if he's already dead. It was too obvious a challenge. The twins knew the links between Indalicio Pardo and Santiago Nassar, and they must have thought that he was the right person to prevent the crime without them being ashamed. But Indalicio Pardo found Santiago Nassar led by the arm of Cristo Bedoya among the groups leaving the port, and he did not dare to prevent it. My paste has loosened, he told me. He clapped each of them on the shoulder, and let them continue. They hardly noticed it, as they were still engrossed in the accounts of the wedding. People dispersed towards the square in the same direction as them. It was a tight crowd, but Escolastica Cisneros thought he observed that the two friends walked in the center without difficulty, within an empty circle, because people knew that Santiago Nassar was going to die, and they did not dare to touch him. Cristo Bedoya also remembered a different attitude towards them. They looked at us as if we had our faces painted, he told me. Moreover, Sarah Noriega opened her shoe store just as they were passing by, and she was shocked by the paleness of Santiago Nassar. But he reassured her. Imagine, Sarah girl, he said without stopping, with this guava tree. Celeste Dangond was sitting in her pajamas at the door of her house mocking those who remained dressed to greet the bishop, and invited Santiago Nassar to have coffee. It was to buy time while I was thinking, he told me. But Santiago Nassar replied that he was in a hurry to change his clothes to have breakfast with my sister. I made balls, 
Celeste Dangond explained, because suddenly it seemed to me that they could not kill him if I was so sure of what he was going to do. Yamal Shyam was the only one who did what he set out to do. As soon as he found out about the rumor, he went to the door of his clothing store and waited for Santiago Nassar to prevent it. He was one of the last Arabs to arrive with Ibrahim Nassar, he was his deck partner until death, and he remained the hereditary advisor of the family. Nobody had as much authority as he to speak with Santiago Nassar. However, he thought that if the rumor was unfounded it would cause him a useless alarm, and he preferred to first consult with Cristo Bedoya in case he was better informed. He called him in passing. Cristo Bedoya patted Santiago Nassar on the back, already at the corner of the plaza, and responded to Yamal Shyam's call. Until Saturday, he said. Santiago Nassar did not answer him, but addressed Yamal Shyam in Arabic and he also replied in Arabic, twisting with laughter. It was a pun that we always had fun with, Yamal Shyam told me. Without stopping, Santiago Nassar waved his hand to both of them and turned the corner of the plaza. It was the last time they saw him. Cristo Bedoya barely had time to hear Yamal Shyam's information when he ran out of the store to catch up with Santiago Nassar. She had seen him turn the corner, but did not find him among the groups that were beginning to disperse in the square. Several people to whom he asked about him gave the same answer, I just saw him with you. It seemed impossible to him that he had reached his house in such a short time, but he went in any way to ask for him, for he found the front door unlocked and ajar. He entered without seeing the paper on the floor, and crossed the darkened room trying not to make noise, because it was still too early for visitors, but the dogs rioted in the back of the house and came out to meet him. He calmed them with the keys, as he had learned from the owner, and continued to harass them into the kitchen. In the corridor he passed Divin a floor carrying a bucket of water and a mop to polish the floors of the room. She assured him that Santiago Nassar had not returned. Victoria Guzman had just put the rabbit stew on the stove when he entered the kitchen. She understood immediately. His heart was leaking out of his mouth, he told me. Cristo Bedoya asked her if Santiago Nassar was at home, and she answered with feigned candor that he had not yet come to sleep. It's serious, Cristo Bedoya told him, they are looking for him to kill him. Victoria Guzman forgot her candor. Those poor boys don't kill anyone, he said. They have been drinking since Saturday, said Cristo Bedoya. For the same reason, she replied, there is no drunk who eats his own poop. Cristo Bedoya returned to the living room, where Divina Flor had just opened the windows. Of course it wasn't raining, Cristo Bedoya told me. It was barely seven o'clock, and already a golden sun was coming through the windows. He asked Divina Flor again if she was sure that Santiago Nassar had not entered the living room door. She was not as sure then as the first time. He asked her about Placida Lanero, and she replied that a moment ago she had put her coffee on the bedside table, but had not woken her up. It was always like that, he would wake up at seven, have his coffee, and come down to give instructions for lunch. Cristo Bedoya looked at his watch, it was 6.56. Then he went up to the second floor to convince himself that Santiago Nassar had not entered. The bedroom door was locked from the inside because Santiago Nassar had left through his mother's bedroom. Cristo Bedoya not only knew the house as well as his own, but he had so much confidence in the family that he pushed open the door of Placida Lanero's bedroom to go from there to the adjoining bedroom. A dusty shaft of sunlight came through the skylight, and the beautiful woman asleep in the hammock, on her side, her bride's hand on her cheek, looked unreal. It was like an apparition, Cristo Bedoya told me. He gazed at her for a moment, fascinated by her beauty, and then he crossed the bedroom in silence, passed the bathroom, and entered Santiago Nassar's bedroom. The bed was still intact, and on the chair was the horseman's hat, and on the floor were the boots next to the spurs. On the nightstand, Santiago Nassar's wristwatch read 6.58. Suddenly I thought he had come out armed again, Cristo Bedoya told me but he found the magnum in the drawer of the nightstand. I had never fired a gun, Cristo Bedoya told me, 
but I decided to take the revolver to take it to Santiago Nassar. He fastened it on his belt, inside his shirt, and only after the crime did he realize that it was unloaded. Plachita Lanero appeared at the door with the cup of coffee as he closed the drawer. Good God, she exclaimed, what a fright you have given me. Cristo Bedoya was also scared. He saw her in broad light, in a gown of golden larks and her hair tousled, and the charm was gone. He explained a bit confused that he had gone in to look for Santiago Nassar. He went to greet the bishop, Plachita Lanero said. It passed by, he said. I guessed it, she said. He is the son of the worst mother. He did not continue, because at that moment he realized that Cristo Bedoya did not know where to put the body. I hope God has forgiven me, Plachita Lanero told me, but I saw him so confused that it suddenly occurred to me that he had entered to steal. He asked what was wrong with him. Cristo Bedoya was aware of being in a suspicious situation, but did not have the courage to reveal the truth to him. I haven't slept for a minute, he told her. He left without further explanation. Anyway, he told me, she always imagined that she was being robbed. In the plaza he met Father Amador who was returning to the church with the ornaments of the frustrated mass, but he did not think he could do anything for Santiago Nassar other than save his soul. He was heading towards the port again when he felt that they were calling him from Clotilde Armenta's shop. Pedro Vicario was at the door, livid and disheveled, with his shirt open and his sleeves rolled up to the elbows, and with the rough knife that he himself had made from a hacksaw blade. His attitude was too insolent to be casual, and yet it was not the only or most visible that he tried in the last minutes to prevent him from committing the crime. Cristobal, he shouted, tell Santiago Nassar that we are waiting for him here to kill him. Cristo Bedoya would have done him the favor of stopping him. If I had known how to fire a revolver, Santiago Nassar would be alive, he told me. But the thought alone impressed him, after all he had heard about the devastating power of an armored bullet. I warn you, he is armed with a magnum capable of passing through an engine, he yelled. Pedro Vicario knew it was not true. He was never armed if he wasn't wearing riding clothes, he told me. But she had expected her to be anyway when she made the decision to wash her sister's honor. The dead don't shoot, he yelled. Pablo Vicario then appeared at the door. He was as pale as the brother, and he had on his wedding jacket and the knife wrapped in the newspaper. If it hadn't been for that, Cristo Bedoya told me, I would never have known which of the two was which. Clotilde Armenta appeared behind Pablo Vicario, and shouted at Cristo Bedoya to hurry up because in this town of queers only a man like him could prevent the tragedy. Everything that happened thereafter was in the public domain. People returning from the port, alerted by the screams, began to take positions in the square to witness the crime. Cristo Bedoya asked several acquaintances about Santiago Nassar, but no one had seen him. At the door of the social club he met Colonel Lazaro Aponte and told him what had just happened in front of Clotilde Armenta's store. It can't be, said Colonel Aponte, because I sent them to sleep. I just saw them with a knife for killing pigs, said Cristo Bedoya. It can't be, because I took them off before I sent them to sleep, said the mayor. It must be that you saw them before that. I saw them two minutes ago and each one had a knife to kill pigs, said Cristo Bedoya. Oh shit, said the mayor, so they must have come back with others. He promised to take care of that instantly, but he went into the social club to confirm a domino date for that night, and when he came out again the crime was already consummated. Cristo Bedoya then made his only fatal mistake, he thought that Santiago Nassar had decided at the last minute to have breakfast at our house before changing his clothes, and there he went to look for him. He hurried along the riverbank, asking everyone he met if they had seen him go by, but no one gave him a reason. He was not alarmed, because there were other roads to our house. Prospera Orango, the Kashika, begged him to do something for his father who was dying in the sardinal of his house, immune to the fleeting blessing of the bishop. I had seen him as I passed by, my sister Margot told me, and he already looked like a dead man. Cristo Bedoya took four minutes to establish the patient's condition, 
and promised to return later for an emergency appeal, but he lost three more minutes helping Prospera Orango take him to the bedroom. When he came out again, he heard remote screams and it seemed to him that rockets were exploding along the course of the square. He tried to run, but the revolver loosely fitted at his waist prevented him. As he rounded the last corner, he recognized my mother from behind as she was almost dragging her youngest son. Luisa Santiago, he shouted at her, where is your godson? My mother turned slightly, her face bathed in tears. Oh, son, he answered, they say they killed him. So it was. While Cristo Bedoya was looking for him, Santiago Nassar had entered the house of Flora Miguel, his girlfriend, just around the corner where he last saw him. It didn't occur to me that he was there, he told me, because these people never got up before noon. It was a common version that the whole family slept until twelve by order of Nahir Miguel, the wise man of the community. That is why Flora Miguel, who no longer cooked in two waters, remained like a rose, says Mercedes. The truth is that they left the house closed until very late, like so many others, but they were early and industrious people. The parents of Santiago Nassar and Flora Miguel had agreed to marry them off. Santiago Nassar accepted the commitment in full adolescence, and was determined to fulfill it, perhaps because he had the same utilitarian conception of marriage as his father. Flora Miguel, for her part, had a certain floral condition, but she lacked grace and judgment and had served as a bridesmaid to her entire generation, so that the agreement was a providential solution for her. They had an easy courtship, without formal visits or concerns of the heart. The wedding several times postponed was finally scheduled for next Christmas. Flora Miguel woke up that Monday with the first roars of the bishop's ship, and very shortly after she learned that the Vicario twins were waiting for Santiago Nassar to kill him. To my sister the nun, the only one who spoke with her after the misfortune, she said that she did not even remember who had told her. I only know that at six in the morning everyone knew, he told her. However, it seemed inconceivable that Santiago Nassar was going to be killed, and instead it occurred to him that he was going to be forcibly married to Angela Vicario so that he would return his honor. He suffered a crisis of humiliation. While half the town waited for the bishop, she was in her bedroom crying with rage, and putting in order the chest of letters that Santiago Nassar had sent her from school. Whenever he passed by Flora Miguel's house, even if no one was there, Santiago Nassar scraped the metal screen of the windows with his keys. That Monday, she was waiting for him with the chest of letters on her lap. Santiago Nassar couldn't see her from the street, but instead she saw him approaching through the metal net from before he scraped her with the keys. Come in, he said. No one, not even a doctor, had entered that house at 6.45 in the morning. Santiago Nassar had just dropped off Cristo Bedoya at Yamal Shyam's store, and there were so many people waiting for him in the plaza that it was not understandable why no one saw him enter his girlfriend's house. The examining magistrate even looked for a person who had seen it, and he did it with as much persistence as I, but he could not be found. On folio 382 of the summary, he wrote another marginal sentence in red ink, Fatality makes us invisible. The fact is that Santiago Nassar entered through the front door, in full view of everyone, and without doing anything to avoid being seen. Flora Miguel was waiting for him in the living room, green with anger, in one of the dresses with unfortunate rings that she used to wear on memorable occasions, and she put the chest in his hands. Here you go, he said. And I hope they kill you. Santiago Nassar was so perplexed that the chest fell from his hands and his loveless letters were scattered on the floor. He tried to reach Flora Miguel in the bedroom, but she closed the door and put the knocker on. He played several times, and called her with a voice too urgent for the hour, so the whole family came flustered. Among consanguins and politicians, adults and minors, there were more than fourteen. The last one to come out was Nahir Miguel, the father, with the red beard and the Bedouin Jalaba that he brought from his land and that he always used inside the house. I saw him many times, and he was immense and parsimonious, but what impressed me most was the brilliance of his authority. Flora, 
she called in her tongue. Open the door. He entered the daughter's bedroom, while the family contemplated Santiago Nassar absorbed. He was kneeling in the living room, picking up the letters from the floor and putting them in the chest. It seemed like a penance, they told me. Nahir Miguel came out of the bedroom after a few minutes, waved his hand, and the entire family disappeared. He continued speaking in Arabic to Santiago Nassar. From the first moment I understood that I had no idea what I was saying, he told me. Then he asked him specifically if he knew that the Vicario brothers were looking for him to kill him. He turned pale, and so lost control that it was impossible to believe he was pretending, he told me. He agreed that his attitude was not so much one of fear as of embarrassment. You will know if they are right or not, he said. But in any case, now you only have two paths left, either you hide here, which is your home, or you go out with my rifle. I don't understand a damn thing, said Santiago Nassar. It was the only thing he managed to say, and he said it in Spanish. He looked like a wet bird, Nahir Miguel told me. She had to take the chest out of his hands because he didn't know where to put it to open the door. It will be two against one, he said. Santiago Nassar left. People had positioned themselves in the square as in the days of parades. They all saw him leave, and they all understood that he already knew they were going to kill him, and he was so embarrassed that he could not find his way home. They say that someone shouted from a balcony, not there, Turk, by the old port. Santiago Nassar searched for the voice. Yamal Shyam yelled at him to go into his tent, and he went in to get his hunting shotgun, but he didn't remember where he had hidden the cartridges. They began to yell at him from all sides, and Santiago Nassar went back and forth several times, dazzled by so many voices at the same time. It was obvious that she was heading home through the kitchen door, but she must have suddenly realized that the front door was open. Here he comes, said Pedro Vicario. They had both seen it at the same time. Pablo Vicario took off his jacket, put it on the stool, and unwrapped the knife in the shape of a cutlass. Before leaving the store, without agreeing, they both crossed themselves. Then Clotilde Armenta grabbed Pedro Vicario by the shirt and yelled at Santiago Nassar to run because they were going to kill him. It was such an urgent cry that it shut off the others. At first he got scared, Clotilde Armenta told me because he didn't know who was yelling at him, or from where. But when he saw her, he also saw Pedro Vicario, who threw her to the ground with a push, and caught up with his brother. Santiago Nassar was less than 50 meters from his house, and he ran to the front door. Five minutes earlier, in the kitchen, Victoria Guzman had told Placida Lanero what everyone already knew. Placida Lanero was a woman with strong nerves, so she did not show any signs of alarm. He asked Victoria Guzman if she had said something to her son, and she lied to him conscientiously, as she replied that she still did not know anything when he came down to have coffee. In the living room, where she continued mopping the floors, Divina Flor saw at the same time that Santiago Nassar entered the plaza door and climbed the ship stairs from the bedrooms. It was a clear vision, Divina Flor told me. She was wearing the white dress, and something in her hand that I couldn't see well, but it looked like a bouquet of roses. So when Placida Lanero asked about him, Divina Flor reassured her. He went up to the room a minute ago, he told her. Placida Lanero then saw the paper on the ground, but did not think to pick it up, and only found out what it said when someone later showed it to her in the confusion of the tragedy. Through the door he saw the Vicario brothers running toward the house with bare knives. From where she was, she could see them, but she couldn't see her son running from another angle toward the door. I thought they wanted to break into the house to kill him, he told me. Then he ran to the door and slammed it shut. He was passing the bar when he heard the screams of Santiago Nassar, and he heard the terror punches at the door, but he believed that he was upstairs insulting the Vicario brothers from the balcony of his bedroom. He went up to help him. Santiago Nassar needed only a few seconds to enter when the door closed. He managed to strike several times with his fists, 
and then he turned to face his enemies with bare hands. I was scared when I saw him head on, Pablo Vicario told me, because he seemed twice as big as it was. Santiago Nassar raised his hand to stop Pedro Vicario's first blow, who attacked him from the right flank with the straight knife. Sons of bitches! Scream! The knife pierced the palm of his right hand, then plunged deep into his side. They all heard her cry of pain. Oh my mother! Pedro Vicario again withdrew the knife with his fierce butcher's pulse, and struck him a second blow almost in the same place. The strange thing is that the knife came out clean again, Pedro Vicario declared to the instructor. He had hit it at least three times and there was not a drop of blood. Santiago Nassar twisted with his arms crossed over his stomach after the third stab, let out a calf whine, and tried to turn his back on them. Pablo Vicario, who was to his left with the curved knife, then delivered the only knife to his back, and a jet of high-pressure blood soaked his shirt. It smelled like him, he told me. Three times mortally wounded, Santiago Nassar gave them the front again, and leaned back against his mother's door without the slightest resistance, as if he only wanted to help them finish killing him in equal parts. He did not shout again, Pedro Vicario said to the instructor. On the contrary, it seemed to me that he was laughing. Then they both continued to stab him against the door, with alternate, easy blows, floating in the dazzling backwater they found on the other side of fear. They did not hear the screams of the entire town, terrified of their own crime. I felt like when you are running on a horse, declared Pablo Vicario. But both of them suddenly awoke to reality, because they were exhausted, and yet it seemed to them that Santiago Nassar was never going to collapse. Shit, cousin, Pablo Vicario told me, you can't imagine how difficult it is to kill a man. Trying to finish forever, Pedro Vicario looked for his heart, but he looked for it almost in the armpit, where pigs have it. In reality, Santiago Nassar did not fall because they themselves were holding him with a knife against the door. Desperate, Pablo Vicario gave him a horizontal cut in the belly, and the entire intestines erupted with an explosion. Pedro Vicario was about to do the same, but his pulse twisted in horror, and he slashed his thigh astray. Santiago Nassar remained leaning against the door for a moment, until he saw his own viscera in the sun, clean and blue and fell to his knees. After shouting for him through the bedrooms, hearing without knowing where other cries that were not his, Placida Lanero looked out the window of the square and saw the Vicario twins running towards the church. They were closely pursued by Yamal Shyam, with his tiger-killing shotgun, and by other unarmed Arabs, and Placida Lanero thought the danger had passed. Then he went out to the balcony of the bedroom, and saw Santiago Nassar in front of the door, face down in the dust, trying to get up from his own blood. He stood up on his side, and began to walk in a state of hallucination, holding the hanging entrails with his hands. He walked over a hundred yards to go around the house completely and go through the kitchen door. He was still lucid enough not to go down the street, which was the longest way, but instead entered the house next door. Pancho Lano, his wife, and their five children had not found out what had just happened twenty steps from their door. We heard the shouting, the wife told me, but we thought it was the bishop's party. They were beginning to have breakfast when they saw Santiago Nassar enter, drenched in blood, carrying the cluster of his entrails in his hands. Pancho Lano told me, what I could never forget was the terrible smell of shit. But Argenita Lano, the eldest daughter, said that Santiago Nassar walked with the same poise of always, measuring his steps well, and that his Saracen face with the tousled curls was more beautiful than ever. As he passed the table he smiled at them, and continued through the bedrooms to the back exit of the house. We were paralyzed with fright, our Alano told me. My Aunt Wayne Frida Marquez was descaling a tarpon in the backyard of her house on the other side of the river, and she saw it descend the steps of the old dock searching with a firm step for the direction of her house. Santiago, son, he yelled at him, what's wrong with you? Santiago Nassar recognized her. That they killed me, Wayne girl, he said. He stumbled on the bottom step, 
but sat up immediately. He was even careful to shake the dirt off his guts with his hand, my Aunt Wayne told me. Then he entered his home through the back door, which had been open since six, and collapsed on his face in the kitchen. And A Chronicle of a Death Foretold Gabriel Garcia Marquez